from the top rope, and the Great American Bash, I bid you all good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the $55 million studio on the Pro Wrestle Machine. Let's get into this issue. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, November 30, 1998 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Three top stars potentially done with wrestling. WCW World War III Recap, Tons of News. By Observer Staff. The in-ring future of three of the top wrestling stars of this era looks to be in major question, with existing injuries seriously threatening the careers of Shawn Michaels and Masahiro Chono, and the business split, whether part of an angle or otherwise, between Hulk Hogan, WCW and Eric Bischoff. As the inside story goes, which may or may not have a degree of validity, Hogan and Bischoff had a business falling out when Bischoff decided to go with Hogan's enemy, Kevin Nash, as new booker, thus greatly diluting Hogan's political power. It was also made clear to Hogan that due to WWF's huge ratings victories over the past few weeks with the margin growing to record proportions on November 16th, that they were no longer going to build the entire company and nearly every major angle around him and that. As many have clamored for more than one year, Bischoff realizes the company needs to build new and younger stars for the future. The straw that may have broken the camel's back is the current plan for Nash to beat Bill Goldberg for the WCW title at Starcade, since Hogan agreed to put Goldberg over cleanly the right way for the title on July 6 at the Georgia Dome as part of a deal where Goldberg's first loss would be to him, most likely at Starcade. While there were tentative plans on the table for Nash to win the Battle Royal and then the title at Starcade before any of this happened. There was also serious talk that the end result of this would be for Nash to rejoin the black and white at that point and possibly even hand the belt to Hogan. And this was the first time it was made clear that wasn't happening. Rather than stay with his power diluted, Hogan chose to leave the company and is expected to announce his retirement from pro wrestling on Thanksgiving night on The Jay Leno Show. The fact that his name was mentioned so prominently on both the pay-per-view show and on both the November 23rd and November 24th editions Nitro, which all heavily plugged the Leno appearance, makes clear this is largely an angle. Hogan wasn't in either Auburn Hills or Grand Rapids, Michigan for the two shows. Generally, but not universally speaking, the morale of the wrestlers was much better without him as he was largely seen by most of the younger wrestlers, as the political enemy holding them back. There has been a lot of speculation about what game is actually being played and I've yet to speak to one person in the organization who believes this is anything but an angle, even though the office is trying to convince talent it's a shoot. At least some wrestlers appear on the surface to believe it although the more savvy ones are more skeptical. Hogan has told friends in the company that he's through because Bischoff backstabbed him for Nash. One would think if the belief is the hiatus will be anything but short-term, that Hogan would at least have a retirement show and turn himself babyface in the process, but if this were to happen, it would still wind up with him dominating storylines. With the company in a state of horrible morale, nearly total disorganization and communication and with the recent expanding gap in the all-important Monday night ratings which for whatever reason this business revolves almost totally around, Bischoff recognized changes needed to be made. That isn't even to mention the more important financially decline in buy rates and the Hogan Warrior match, which cost an incredible amount of money to put together, flopping both as a TV angle and as a pay-per-view attraction. The feeling was to reach out to Nash, who seemingly has spearheaded the anti-Hogan and anti-Bischoff forces in the past, but may be the most influential of the wrestlers in the locker room, and has a reputation for coming up with good ideas, as some say many of the booking ideas that propelled WCW's rise came from Nash and Scott Hall. It appears that Diamond Dallas Page was the liaison in bringing the two together, and that Nash appears right now to be the main booking power, with Page as an assistant, whether official or not and with people like Dusty Rhodes, Harry Taylor and Kevin Sullivan all helping out. The changes are hardly a panacea, because all the potential morale problems when wrestlers who are working on top are given booking power are already evident. There are also some in the industry from the WWF side who believe the business has evolved to the point that script writing for Monday night television and pay-per-view shows is a full-time job and that a wrestler who is out of the office and not working 60 hours a week specifically on it wouldn't be able to handle it because the standards and audience expectations when it comes to storylines have been elevated so much this year. Because of the almost total lack of trust in the WCW locker room, and WCW's locker room is hardly alone, due to Bischoff in the past trying to unnecessarily work angles to fool the boys. There are people who believe this is an angle by Bischoff and Hogan working together because changes were needed badly from a morale standpoint and Hogan had openly talked about taking time off before any of this happened. From a personality standpoint, Bischoff has also done an about-face, being a lot nicer to the wrestlers and clearly not wanting to lose any top talent, or at least any more top talent. 
nearly everyone internally considers it close to a given that Giant is leaving for WWF, and that whether officially or unofficially, the deal is already done, and that he's already given notice even with a huge offer, $2.9 million over three years, offered by WCW to stay. WCW having Giant job for Goldberg on television for the Jackhammer, after Goldberg kicked out of the choke slam, in a scant 134 in the November 23rd Nitro main event, seems to indicate the company is re-signed to that happening. Both Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho have been vocal about not signing new deals with huge raises that have been put in front of them, Benoit to the point of making it clear on a WCW internet broadcast that he wanted out, and WWF would no doubt be strongly interested in both. Reports from both sides indicate that Scott Steiner, who had dialogue with WWF and whose contract expires next week, would most likely be staying since WWF wasn't willing to come close to WCW's $500,000 per year three-year guaranteed money deal and there were concerns within WWF about Steiner's physical condition, both from a visual and injury standpoint. Other speculation is that it's Hogan, who history has shown is the master player in the game of booking chess, recognizing all the signs that WCW is headed for a business decline, seeing his loss of power that Bischoff needed to do from a morale standpoint with all the major contracts coming due in the next year and so many of the wrestlers whose deals are coming due openly talking about leaving for the WWF but that business decline when it comes to overall ratings and attendance figures isn't really noticeable yet. When WCW lost badly in the November 2nd ratings, Hogan wasn't there, nor were many of the other top draws, but with Hogan back on November 9th and November 16th, the pattern only got worse. If those patterns of losing on Mondays, although the other TV show ratings remain steady and house show business is largely very good, continued and the gap grew, and the pay-per-view declines are indicative of a business that peaked realistically in early 1998 and is being propped up by wrestling in general being so hot and getting so much coverage that the declines are just starting to show up now from a business standpoint. If that is the case, it's the perfect time for Hogan to disappear. This is a game that many in the industry, including Hogan on more than one occasion in WWF, Bret Hart once, and Antonio Inoki who is the other most politically successful long-term wrestling icon of this generation in the business, have played, figuring months from now if the decline continues. They'll be begging for him to come back, and he can do so under his own terms at that point. It's a game that has obvious risks and benefits depending upon what happens when the party involved is gone. No doubt Hogan will try and maintain his public spotlight while away from wrestling doing his running for president gimmick, and probably use his wrestling retirement as part of the angle to show he's serious in chasing the ghost of former rival Jesse Ventura. There is also the Fox Network wild card. Bischoff has told people that Hogan's contract which has more than one year to go, wouldn't allow him to wrestle for a rival group, but others in WCW have talked openly about the possibility of Hogan leaving for Fox, who he's known to have negotiated with earlier this year, and taking his crew with them, and ride that pony for all the exposure it can get him. Logic would make it seem that starting a new company with these two monster established organizations and building it as a vehicle for a rapidly fading star, albeit with more name value still than anyone in the industry, would look to be a long shot but his name alone opens up a lot of doors. The irony of this maneuver is that it comes at a time when Hogan is coming off a year with perhaps the most mainstream exposure of his career, both capitalizing as the most recognizable name in the latest wrestling boom, is doing angles with Carl Malone, Dennis Rodman and Jay Leno and getting a stretch from Ventura winning governor. For most of 1998, Hogan was still the biggest television ratings draw in the industry and is still the main draw in most of the 10 highest rated segments of the year, As WCW has fallen to WWF in the ratings war, so has Hogan's ratings drawing power taken a tumble over the past two months. This is all taking place two weeks before Hogan was going to be put on the covered, December 5th issue, with four different covers with Hogan and Undertaker, Steve Austin and Goldberg, of a major wrestling feature in TV Guide, the best-selling magazine in the country and he'd already had the Tonight Show appearance booked in his running for president gimmick that has gotten a surprising amount of attention. As far as Nash goes, He immediately started the tease, which likely will take a long time to come to fruition, of a reuniting with Hall. While it seemed nobody liked the World War III pay-per-view show, it was certainly no worse than it appeared to be going in on paper. Nitro the next night was flat as far as crowd reactions, and without Hogan, somehow did seem to be missing fire and star power, which had been WCW's strengths. Nash did a good job of building his program with Goldberg, which whether he's Booker or not, needs a lot of emphasis being it's the Starcade main event. Page's program was pushed, but no more than it had been before. The only noticeable changes from the show is that the really lame repetitive segments for the most part were gone, the in-ring wrestling was slightly improved, 
the overall heat and crowd enthusiasm for the product seemed down with Hogan writing himself out without passing the torch, and for the first time the company is starting to do angles with the cruiserweights. But it hardly went without notice that on the pay-per-view, his match, advertised as one of the headline matches, didn't take place, and that he destroyed everyone in his ring in the Battle Royal and there are plans for him to follow by ending Goldberg's streak, although logic would indicate Bam Bam Bigelow should be involved in costing Goldberg the match rather than him losing cleanly based on where the booking appears to be going. Michaels returned to WWF television as the new Hill Commissioner on November 17 coincided with the diagnosis of his back specialist, who gave him the word about 10 days ago that his career is over. Michaels, 33 who wants to return, but probably in a limited in-ring role as far as scheduling goes, is looking for a second or a third opinion. WWF had largely kept him off television for a variety of reasons, some having to do with morale, some having to do with the fact he's not particularly good at announcing when exposed for any length of time. The feeling was he could be reintroduced with an angle, which more likely than not would have been to turn on DX, and feud with Triple H, when he was physically ready. With a word that may not be possible, WWF is attempting to get some return on its $750,000 per year contract with Michaels by making him at least a television Hill Commissioner character whose role would be, at least for the short term, to screw with the wrestlers in the WWF except Steve Austin, who Vince and Shane McMahon will concentrate on, which also may guard against the long-term overexposure of events. And there's always time for the inevitable McMahon-Michaels split as well. Chono35 who was New Japan's biggest drawing card this year returned from attempted rehabilitation in Germany on November 21st with the word being it was unsuccessful. Chono said that his neck was in tremendous pain, stemming from an injury in a 1992 match with Steve Austin that he never let fully heal and had progressively gotten worse, and he finally had no choice but to get out of the ring when his body turned on him in September. He made it clear that he wouldn't be able to return for the January 4th Tokyo Dome show, the traditional biggest show of the year in Japan. Over the past two weeks there has been a lot of talk that Chono would need major neck surgery to regain mobility of his neck, which he's been trying to avoid, and that operation could be such that it would be impossible to return. Amidst all the turmoil, WCW presented what at this point appears to be its final three-ring battle royal-driven pay-per-view event. Apparently the decision was actually considered a few weeks back to eliminate the 60-man battle royal concept, which has resulted in a poor television event every year, but since so much advertising was already out, and with WCW already in hot water with cable companies over the Halloween Havoc fiasco, the decision was made to at least continue it for this show. The show was overall below average, but probably better than a lot of expectations going in, drawing a sellout 17,670 fans, the 16,588 paying $455,510 plus another $170,268 in merchandise the $10 plus per head in merchandise is back up to the early year peak standards and far ahead of what WWF, WCW and ECW house shows are generally doing nowadays, to the Palace in Auburn Hills, Michigan, Going into the final week, nearly the entire show was unknown, but they had a complete card announced on WCW Saturday night the day before the event. Of the 10 matches announced, three of them never took place as advertised and even though angles were done for two of them and none of the matches were actually missed by anyone, that's a lot of false advertising since it was well known at least before the WCW Saturday night show was taped that none of the matches were going to take place. Rick Steiner vs. Scott Steiner, who at least were at the show and did a three minutes long angle, couldn't take place since Rick Steiner had just underwent a second shoulder operation less than two weeks before the show and the apparent plan now is to use the pay-per-view angle as the storyline reason that Rick will be out of the ring for the next several months. Scott Hall vs. Kevin Nash also didn't take place. It's a feud that never got over for a number of reasons, perhaps the main one being that the participants never really wanted to break up their team or work against each other in the first place, and when they gave little hype in that direction, the fans followed suit not caring. Based on recent TV angles of particular one on Nitro six nights earlier, fans wanted to see Hall and Nash join forces once again rather than fight each other, and fans were more up for the angle teasing their reuniting then for anything they could have possibly done in the ring. The other match that admittedly nobody missed, although with the exception of Diamond Dallas Page vs. Bret Hart, there probably wasn't a match on the show that anyone would have missed, was a Scott Norton IWGP heavyweight title match against Booker T. As mentioned last week, the company had plans to shoot an angle on November 17th in Salina, Kansas which would air on the Saturday night show the day before. Norton, when informed that night of the angle and match, wasn't happy with it, nor was T, and the angle and match were scrapped. That still didn't stop WCW on its Saturday night show which has the production, commentary and packages put together the day before the show airs, from advertising the match on the pay-per-view anyway. 
with almost no hype directed at the matches, you had a sluggish crowd that wasn't into much on the show except for appearances by Bill Goldberg, and some spots worked around the giant in the Battle Royal. The matches had no strong issues and with the exception of Juventud Guerrera's cruiserweight title loss back to Billy Kidman, none were all that good. Rather than end with the Battle Royal, they put Page vs. Hart as the final match, and the two worked very hard and it was a good match, but for whatever reason, didn't get much heat for their efforts and their finish was beyond lame. I think we could all live without seeing finishes based on the Survivor Series 1997 for the rest of our natural lives as it's a poor finish for casual fans, every time I've seen it both on the major league and indie level, it's bombed, and even though this was a double swerve, the groaning over seeing the spot took people out of the match to where they didn't even care it was a swerve of the real finish. 1. Wrath, Brian Clark, Kane Glacier, Ray Lloyd, after the meltdown in 822. It went too long as Wrath's gimmick for him to get over has to be as a destroyer. Glacier took a nice bump off the apron crashing on the guardrail. Wrath whipped Glacier over the guardrail into the stands. Glacier missed a chronic, I know, kick that was supposed to hit and Wrath sold it and put on the spike. Wrath got away and finished him with a meltdown. Tepid heat. One half of one star. Two. Stevie Ray, Lane Huffman beat Conn and Charles Ashenoff, via DQ in 655. Ray threw a thrust kick that missed by 5 inches that Conan sold. Vincent kept interfering. Conan suffered a bloody nose. Vincent set up a spot where he was going to hit Conan with the slapjack but Conan reversed it and Ray took the blow. Well, actually that move missed as well, but Ray sold it like he was dead. Instead of going for the finish, Conan got on top of Ray and kept pummeling him. Ref Billy Silverman tried to stop him and Conan threw him down for the DQ and continued to pound on him. Booker T made the save for his brother and Conan got out of there. Ray then got mad at T for showing up. One half of one star. 3. Ernest Miller and Sonny one who beat Kaz Hayashi and Perry Saturn, Perry Satolo, in A04. Match wasn't as bad as you'd think since Saturn was doing the job, and he was suplexing Miller around the ring beforehand. Still, it's a mess since one who has no real heat, the idea was to give him a win here so he'll get heat out of it, Hayashi has been made out to be a retarded impotent fool and Miller is hard to work with. Miller didn't want to sell anything for Hayashi because of the size difference because he felt if it was real, Hayashi would be too small for him. Except he forgot the key to pro wrestling. It isn't real. And the way the storyline had been played, it was time for Hayashi to at least give the fans hope or there's no way they'd care about any of them. One who mainly ran away. Miller gave Saturn a kick which after some of the kicks earlier in the show looked like positively the greatest kick of all time, by normal standards it didn't look anywhere near good enough to put a guy like Saturn down for that length of time, and one who pinned him. One half of one star. 4. Billy Kidman, Pete Gruner, pinned Juventud Guerrera and Nibal Gonzalez, to regain the WCW Cruiserweight title in 1527. Guerrera came out with an LWO t-shirt on. This brought out Ray Mysterio Jr. who figured out that the reason Eddie Guerrero took the title shot opportunity from him on Nitro was because he was protecting Guerrero. This angle would have almost made sense except that Ray had just gotten a title shot against Kidman the previous day on TVS. Eddie and Ray argued with Ray saying he'd have a surprise. This established Guerrero as the heel for the first time in their feud, even though the fans had been more behind Kidman in their matches since Kidman left the flock. There were a few sloppy spots, but overall it was their typical great match. The fans weren't into it early, but the work was so good they actually got people into it by the final few minutes. With the three rings, they did a lot of spots using two rings and came up with some innovative stuff rather than just repeating moves from all their previous matches, which is really saying something considering how often they've wrestled. Herrera did a spinning head scissors off the top rope onto Kidman who was on the apron, and they both crashed to the floor. Herrera got a near fall with a brain buster and used a springboard drop kick and a springboard plancha and a leg drop from the apron back in for a near fall. Kidman came back with a drop kick, a back suplex and an ankle scissors flipping Guerrera from one ring to the other. Kidman did a crossbody off the top from one ring into the other for a great near fall. Guerrera came back with a double springboard Frankensteiner using two rings. After a few reverses, Guerrera hit the juvie driver but both sold the exhaustion. Guerrero went up for the 450, but Kidman got up and Guerrero flipped over on the move to land on his feet and immediately deliver a Frankensteiner for a great spot and near fall. Guerrero's power bomb was turned into a face buster, followed by a wheelbarrow German suplex. Kidman went up for the shooting star but Guerrero got up and went for an Ultimo Dragon spinning Hurricane Rana, but Mysterio Jr. ran out and held Kidman from taking the bump and Guerrero landed by himself, in the ring. Kidman then hit the shooting star press for the pin. 
After the match, the entire LWO confronted Mysterio Jr. Guerrero said he had to decide if he's within them or against them. Mysterio Jr. threw hit shirt in Guerrero's face and ran out of the ring with the entire LWO on his tail. 3 and 3 quarter stars. The planned Rick vs. Scott Steiner match started with Giant, Ray, Vincent and Brian Adams all attacking Rick backstage. It was obvious Rick had no movement in his right arm. Giant dragged Rick from the back and threw him into the ring. Scott and Buff Bagwell were destroying Rick until he made a left-handed comeback with bad-looking punches on everyone. Finally Goldberg showed up to a huge pop and speared Scott. Goldberg went to jackhammer Scott but the NWO ref hit him with a chair which he no-sold. Goldberg then pressed the ref and heaved him from one ring into the other. It was a pretty hot angle, and would have been fine except. It was followed by another non-match. This time Hall came to the ring with a black and white crew with him. Eric Bischoff then came out and ordered them all to attack Hall, which they did. The new booking Superman Nash cleaned house on just about every hill in the company with some help from Hall. Hall did a wolf pack sign to Nash, but Nash walked away rather than accepted it. It should be noted that during the show there was never even any mention of Booker T vs. Norton, although they kept saying so many times that Hulk Hogan wasn't there and not going to be in the Battle Royal, and he wasn't there, that with the credibility of the announcers, everyone was expecting him to make a surprise appearances, and in a sense were probably disappointed by the end of the night that he wasn't there. 5. Chris Jericho, Chris Irvine, retained the WCW TV title beating Bobby Duncombe Jr. in 1319. Jericho did a very good job in this match considering nobody knew or cared about Duncombe and Duncombe was okay at best, and that was probably illusion created by Jericho, in his big chance. Jericho did a lot of nice moves including a springboard clothesline off the guardrail, a missile dropkick and springboard dropkick. It went too long for the live crowd as Duncombe meant nothing to them. A lot of near falls at the end. Duncombe blocked a lion tamer and did an elbow drop off the middle rope for a near fall. Ralphus, Jericho's head of security, grabbed Duncombe's leg. As Duncombe went after him, Jericho grabbed the title belt and cracked Duncombe with it for the pin. Two stars. 6. Nash won the 59-man three-ring battle royal which saw the first segment last 10.40 before cutting it down to a one-ring 20-man battle royal which went another 11.53. The list of participants were Alex Wright, Bobby Blaze, Barry Darso, Chavo Guerrero Jr., Chip Minton, a former member of the U.S. Olympic bobsled team who actually has received a ton of mainstream pub worldwide over the years and whose pay-per-view debut was greeted as being just another no-name jobber walking down the aisle to get dumped in a hurry. Chris Adams, Chris Benoit, Cyclo, Damian, Saturn Disciple, Disco Inferno, Eddie Guerrero, Dandy Giant, Hector Garza, Horace Hogan, Jericho, T, Rath, Miller, Scott Steiner, Norton, Paul, Scotty Riggs, Mysterio Jr., Barry Horowitz, Bobby Eaton, Ray, Kidman, Guerrera, Sikosis, Dean Malenko, Steve McMichael, Hayashi, Lex Luger, Conan, Chris Canyon Nash, Johnny Swinger, Renegade, Scott Putsky, Silver King, Super Kolo, Magnum Tokyo, Van Hammer, Viano V, Vincent, Kendall Windham, Kenny Chaos, La Parka, Lenny Lane, Lismark Jr., Mike Enos, Lodi, Norman Smiley, Prince Aokia, Buddy Lee Parker, and Glacier. At least it was covered better than in the past, with one announcing crew and a full screen rather than the three-shot simultaneous 20 minutes long test pattern of previous years. While it was never advertised that Hogan would be there, the expectations certainly were of that. No acknowledgement was made as to why Page and Hart, who announcer Mike Tenay had continually called his favorite to win and had been pushed as hard as anyone as being a participant, wasn't in, even if it could be explained with the throwaway line that both Page and Hart made the decision to save themselves for their match. The only main story of the first segment was that Nash was in Ring 3 with 29 guys, Ring 1 had 17 guys, Ring 2 had 13, mostly jobbers and almost single-handedly threw all of them out by 2.42, which gave him almost 9 minutes to rest in the ring by himself. Lots of the eliminations weren't on camera, some weren't even acknowledged, but it was a cool idea to have a countdown of the number constantly on the screen. They used the same rules as last year where a guy simply had to be thrown out of the ring, not necessarily over the top rope, to be eliminated. The only memorable elimination was Hall giving Psychosis a fallaway slam over the top to the floor. It came down to the final 20. Miller and Saturn were out immediately, followed by Chavo, Wright, Eddie Guerrero and Disco who were all on the floor waiting for Giant to press Kidman and throw him out. Most of the crowd reaction to the match was based around Giant, which is great since he's already given notice. Anyway, this was all in the first 35 seconds. Nash and Hall attacked Giant which got a big pop. Luger threw out Ray. McMichael dumped Norton. Nash dumped McMichael. 
At this point Bam Bam Bigelow ran in but Hall and Nash kept him from entering the ring and a zillion security guards came out. This brought Goldberg back out and they did another hot pull apart. Shiner and Wrath wound up being thrown out while this was breaking up, followed by T. This left Hall and Giant from black and white, although Hall had been beaten up by Giant earlier in the show Luger, Conan and Nash from Wolfpack and Malenko and Benoit from the Horsemen. Conan flew out attacking Hall, everyone then attacked Giant at the same time, and he fought them off before finally going over the top. Nash and Hall dumped Benoit and Malenko. This left Nash Hall and Luger. They were all brawling with each other showing that everyone wanted to win. Luger went to Rack Hall near the ropes but before he got him up, Nash kicked both of them over the top for the win. One and a half stars. 7. Page Page Falkenberg, pinned Hart to retain the US title in 1831. A very physical match without a lot of heat. Page hit a pescado at the bell and whipped Hart into the steps. They did the reverse tombstone pile driver spot and were rapidly exchanging moves rather than doing the slow build so it came off more like a page match than a heart match. Hart pulled out an object but Page hit him with a crossbody and he dropped the object. Ref Charles Robinson saw the object on the mat and didn't know who brought it out so he put it in his pocket. Page got a real lame looking sharpshooter for a rope break. Crowd was dead. Both Hart and Page did figure fours around the post, and it appeared neither did the move right. Page for sure didn't. Hart worked on Page's knees for a while but Page came back and whipped Hart into the steps again. Hart dropped Page's knee on the guard rail and did the figure four around the post. Page went to use a chair but the ref stopped him from behind and Hart knocked Page into Robinson. He got the object from Robinson's pants and KO'd Page and put on a sharpshooter. The NWO ref ran in and called for the bell without Page submitting which deflated the crowd. Mickey J then ran in and overruled the NWO ref and ordered the match to continue and Page hit the diamond cutter for the pin. Three stars. It appears that the pay-per-view figures for pro wrestling this year while an increase over last year have been exaggerated somewhere between 15 and 20 percent based on the Showtime Event Television's annual pay-per-view industry media overview. It has been in recent years considered traditional exaggerated license to claim figures in the media on pay-per-view events of about 20 percent more than the actual figures. The figures listed are that pro wrestling revenue on pay-per-view increased from $140 million in 1997 to a projected $178 million in 1998, a healthy 27% increase, although a lower figure than the increase in both television ratings and live attendance over the past year. Based on figures released by the companies internally, the figures this year should have slightly topped $200 million and based on the figures released for media consumption and all the wrestling boom and billion-dollar industry stories that the figures have been listed are in the $300 million range which is nearly double the figure Showtime released this past week. Of that $178 million, that would mean that the three companies that produce pay-per-view events, WWF, WCW and ECW would share in a pie of about $76.5 million, with WWF and WCW taking in the lion's share. The figures claimed overall pay-per-view event revenue in 1998 will decline from $400 million in 1997 to $241 million, largely due to pro boxing revenue dropping from $232 million to $40 million because of the almost total absence of big money fights this year besides the Oscar de la Hoya vs. Julio Cesar Chavez match, and probably more importantly, the suspension of the sport's biggest draw, Mike Tyson. In fact, a sizable percentage of the pro wrestling increase can be attributed to Tyson, who was a significant draw for the Royal Rumble and the biggest draw for WrestleMania, the latter of which was the biggest revenue-drawing pay-per-view event in pro wrestling history. Those within boxing expect a huge turnaround in the early part of next year with several big money events planned, the return of Tyson for two or three fights, the unification match with Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis, and at least one big money De La Hoya fight. In contrast to WWF and WCW pro wrestling events, which averaged about $7 million in total revenue, or a realistic figure of about $3 million in company revenue per show, the biggest live concert, a Spice Girls pay-per-view, drew $3 million total and the second biggest, a KISS concert, drew just $538,000 which is less than half of what recent ECW shows have drawn, so at this point in time, pay-per-view still remains an industry driven by big boxing matches, the regular pro wrestling events, and potentially the beleaguered UFC. The gap closed, somewhat due to the WWF's failing again in its attempt to get too cute with a skit where Undertaker choked Steve Austin into unconsciousness, teases burying him alive in them and bombing him alive before finally Kane makes the save at a funeral home said to be somewhere near San Jose.
where Undertaker and Paul Bearer kidnapped Austin from the fictitious San Jose Medical Center after an angle shot at the November 22nd house show at the arena and plugged heavily on Sunday Night Heat. Raw had grown to a 5.4 rating by the time Undertaker and Bearer arrived and carried the unconscious Austin out of the hospital into a hearse and driven to a cemetery. The rating dropped noticeably every quarter until the overrun, losing nearly 900,000 viewers over the next 45 minutes down to a 4.6 for the climax of the lame skit where Kane saved Austin from literally being stabbed to death and the beginning of the Rock vs. X-Pac title match. WCW didn't benefit from this as you'd expect, as Nitro's audience declined initially until slightly picking up toward the end of the show for the Bret Hart vs. Dean Malenko match. Raw still won all eight quarters, making the fourth week in a row Raw has won the race handily. Overall Raw did a 4.86 rating, 4.73 first hour, 5.00 seconds hour, and a 7.25 share. Nitro did a 4.50 rating, 5.03 first hour, 4.35 seconds hour, 4.12 third hour, and a 6.67 share. Over the head-to-head -head 2 hours and 5 minutes, Nitro did a 4.24 rating. Total audience numbers and demographics were unavailable at press time, in comparing the two main events, Rock vs. X-Pac did a 4.60 rating in the final quarter and a 5.30 for the overrun, which is a strong number since it was head-to-head. -head. The WCW Hart vs. Malenko match did a 4.30, which is very competitive with the WWF title match. The 4.32 that Goldberg vs. Giant did, which included one minute going unopposed which means that overall it declined from the previous segment, was beaten handily by the WWF main event. There is no question at this point a lot of steam has been taken from Goldberg as his pops are nothing like they were even six weeks ago and his ratings drawing power is waning even compared with WCW's fortunes, and that giant, at least in WCW, means nothing to the audience at this point. The closest point WCW came was in the third quarter when the Flair slash Bischoff confrontation with the Barry Windham turned it a 4.6, while Raw with Edge in Gangrel vs. Brown and Henry did a 4.8. The biggest gap was the fifth quarter when the triple threat match with Mankind, Shamrock and Bossman plus Undertaker and Bearer showing up at the hospital did a 5.36. The highest point of the night to Nitro's 4.16 for Wrath vs. Kevin Nash, although the actual low point of Nitro was a 3.9 for the Chris Jericho interview where Bobby Dungham hogtied Ralphus. Christine Jarrett the mother of Jerry Jarrett and grandmother of Jeff Jarrett and one of the few successful woman wrestling promoters in the history of the game passed away on November 19 at the age of 75 from complications from a major heart attack suffered about five weeks earlier. Jarrett, who started out working in wrestling in the 1940s selling tickets for Nick Gula's pro wrestling shows in Nashville, was one of only a handful of women in the modern era to promote pro wrestling at a major level. Probably the other most well-known women wrestling promoters were Aileen Eaton in Los Angeles, the widow of promoter Cal Eaton and mother of wrestler slash martial artist judo Jean LaBelle, who ran both pro boxing and pro wrestling at the Olympic Auditorium during the glory days of that building before passing the wrestling promotion to her son Mike LaBelle, and Ann Gunkel in Georgia, who was co-owner of the NWA Georgia Group when husband Ray Gunkel, a part owner, died after a match and after a falling out with the NWA, ran opposition All South Wrestling and was actually the person responsible for getting Ted Turner originally hooked up with pro wrestling as she made the deal to get a pro wrestling show on WTCG in Atlanta, which grew to become TBS. Perhaps the most successful of all was Motoka Bababa, the wife of Giant Baba, who has always had a major hand in the All Japan promotions running the box office and the souvenir stands at All Japan events and until recently had a major say in the booking. Christine Jarrett was best known for running the local shows in Louisville, Lexington and Evansville from 1970 and continuing on for more than 20 years, along with being a fixture at the box office at the Nashville Fairgrounds every Saturday night for as far back as anyone can remember through numerous incarnations of wrestling promoters. In 1970, when Nick Gulas and Roy Welch expanded their wrestling territory, which at its peak spread geographically throughout Tennessee, Kentucky, hit parts of Arkansas and throughout Alabama and Mississippi to northern Kentucky and southern Indiana, Jarrett began as the local promoter. By this point in time Jerry Jarrett was already booking the territory and was one of the top babyfaces along with Jackie Fargo and Tojo Yamamoto. By the late 70s Gulas and Welch had their falling out which wound up with Jarrett and Welch going into partnership, which eventually wound up with a lengthy Jarrett slash Jerry Lawler partnership over what became known as the USWA territory years later. Christine Jarrett ran every aspect of the show with the exception of the actual booking for her weekly towns, including driving the tape of the television show that was taped every Saturday morning in Memphis up to Louisville and Evansville, 
and giving it to the television stations personally for airing the next week. She was also largely responsible for breaking Jim Cornette, who grew up in Louisville, into pro wrestling as he worked the Louisville shows as a photographer starting at the age of 13 and eventually doing the programs, years before breaking in as a manager. If it wasn't for her, I'd have never been able to get into the business, Cornette said. I just loved her to death. Christine Jarrett stopped promoting in the early 90s when traveling to those cities from Nashville became too much of a hardship, and made her final appearance at the Louisville Gardens in 1995 for the 25th anniversary show. She remained a fixture handling the tickets and the box office in Nashville, most recently for Music City Wrestling, until a little over a month ago. Her death was acknowledged on the Memphis Power Pro show and I presume, although don't know it as a fact, that it would have also been mentioned on the Music City TV show either over the weekend or this coming weekend depending upon the taping schedule. The debut of the World Wrestling Federation Super Astro Show on November 22nd, a Spanish program aimed at that market built around Mexican and Puerto Rican wrestlers, drew what on the surface appeared to be strong ratings, but were numbers well down from what Univision had been doing previously in the time slot. The initial show, which airs weekly at noon on Sundays on Univision for 30 minutes, featured three singles matches taped on November 1st in Austin, Texas, a few interviews taped in the building and some studio wraparounds largely introducing fans to the show and to WWF characters like The Rock and Steve Austin. Because it was done as part of a live taping, the production was equivalent to all the rest of the WWF programming and worlds better than the AAA and EMLL shows that air on rival Galavision. The show opened drawing a 7.1 Hispanic rating on the Univision affiliate in Los Angeles, a 5.8 in New York, a 12.0 in Chicago, a 5.5 in Miami and a 3.4 in San Antonio. The rating is derived by the percentage of homes that are listed as being Spanish-speaking homes that are tuned into the show. While the numbers sound impressive, they are down between 15 and 20 percent in every market except for Los Angeles, where they were even, from the previous show in the time slot, a funniest home video show so from a network standpoint the first week of the show wasn't considered a success. In comparison, Lucha Lunes, the AAA show on Galavision, which is a much weaker network than Univision, that airs on Monday night in prime time, head-to-head -head in most of the country with the first hour of Nitro, generally does around 2.0 rating in Los Angeles and Chicago and 0.5 or less in New York, Miami, and San Antonio. When AAA was at its peak in 1993, it generally received roughly a 6.5 Hispanic ratings on regular broadcast television in the Los Angeles market. The first show put over Armando Fernandez, Mexican wrestler Tarzan Boy whose real name is Oziel Toscano, who WWF is attempting to market as its top Latino babyface, El Maringuero, Jesus Castillo of Los Bariquas, who looked both too old and chunky, not to mention not being much of a dancer. For his role as a dancer, and El Eo del Santo, whose appearance was pushed in commentary and bumpers throughout the show with lots of talk in the commentary about his legendary father. Working with Super Loco, Super Crazy, who probably due to his similar ring costume and hair although the two have entirely different physiques, probably look to many like he's the guy under the psychosis mask in WCW, they had a good match. The show also featured Maria Felipe as the Latino babe dancing after the matches with the faces and doing post-match interviews, and an unmasked Max Mini, using that name, also doing interviews, including a comedy spot where he stood on a desk to interview Giant Silva. Japanese Television Rundown October 26, Pankrace 1. Iguizamino will beat Daisuke Shivai unanimous decision after an uneventful 10 minutes. 2. Asami Shibuya won a unanimous decision over Kusei Kubota in 10 minutes of a one sided match as Shibuya pretty much controlled the entire bout. 3. Manabu Yamada beat Daisuke Watanabe in 7 33 with a choke. They've got a rookie named Daisuke Ishii, one named Kengo Watanabe, and now Daisuke Watanabe. Imagine the confusion that must cause. I think they need to change this Watanabe's stage name. It was his first pro match and people got into him. He had some charisma, 4. Omar Buish beat Minoru Suzuki with a choke in 45 seconds. Just sad, 5. Keiichiro Yamamiya beat Jason Delusha via 1-0 score after the 15 minutes time limit expired. Yamamiya in a slugfest almost a fluke left palm that put Delusha down which was the only point of the match. Delusha mounted him and was pounding on him at the end but couldn't get the point back, 6. Kuma Kunyoku beat Masakatsu Funaki via 1-0 score after 15 minutes. This was one of those weird Funaki matches where it almost seemed like he was doing his best not to win. He basically did nothing but defend, and actually looked like a washed-up shot fighter just hanging on. Kunyoku kept getting his ankle and finally got a rope break from an ankle lock. 
Toward the finish, Funaki started fighting rather than defending and he was tagging Kunyoku at will, puffing up both his eyes and bloodying up his nose but never knocked him down so he lost by the point. November 6th UFO This was the TV version of the October 24th Sumo Hall debut card. Overall it came off like a major league production with some really bad angles and matches since the matches looked like badly worked UFC matches rather than a rings or New Japan style. The show opened with Antonio Inoki at Rikidozen's grave site in Tokyo and getting his head shaved at the grave, I guess, in front of Rikidozen's eyes, just as Rikidozen had shaved Inoki's head nearly 40 years ago. 1. The fourth tiger mask from Michinoku Pro Best Ikuto Hidaka of Battlearts in 625. This was the only good match on the show. Alexander Otsuka was in Hidaka's corner. This was old UWS style with a lot of cool suplexes and very good crowd pops. The punches looked weak but some of the kicks and knees looked great, including crisp spinning kicks the crowd really liked. Mask won with an armbar off a triangle. Three and a quarter star. Two. Murakami Kazunari beat Lee Young Gun in 122. This started out with this really cheesy angle where Kazunari came to Young Gun school and Young Gun basically destroyed him using martial arts movie moves. It was one of the worst looking angles ever. They billed Young Gun from Korea, but the school had everything written in English, and he talked perfect English in his interview. Young Gun dominated early doing more movie moves that don't work in real fights, until Kazunari gave him a suplex, hip toss and an armbar for the submission. For what it was it was good but way too short. One star. Three. Orlando Vite beat Jason Press in 522. They were doing UFC ground work but taking a lot off the punches. It was pretty bad until the finish where Vite nailed Press with a knee and delivered this excellent looking kick to the side of the head for the KO. Press sold it as the KO, but when he went down, Vite was pummeling him in the back of the head with weak punch after weak punch until it was stopped. The kick was really sick. One half star. Four. The original Tiger Mask beat Kevin Rosier in 407. Sayama was billed as the father of Valley Tudo. Sayama is the father of a lot of things in this industry including modern junior heavyweight wrestling and of the Shudo promotion, which predated UFC as the first regular non-work shooting type of company so he is the original link between the two worlds, but Valley Tudo isn't one of those things. Sayama got a big pop. Rosier may be the worst pro wrestler I've ever seen. This was one of those matches that was so ungodly awful that it's entertaining. Rosier threw these terrible looking punches, one of which connected for something of a believable knockdown. He's like 6 foot 4, 320 to Sayama's 5 foot 6, 205. Rosier played Superman early and was he horrible at it or what? He makes you get nostalgic for a Jim Duggan vs. Kurgan feud. Finish was something of a Hogan slash Lawler spoof. Sayama did all these cool kicks to set up an ankle lock. Rosier was selling, then made the Superman come back and broke the hold and stood there like Hogan or Luger doing a most muscular in Sayama's face, only Rosier's body doesn't look anything like Hogan or Luger. Sayama then put the ankle lock back on and Rosier submitted. This actually got a lot of heat as bad as it was. Negative half star. 5. Brian Johnson went to a no contest with Gerard Gordeau in 526. Johnson basically claimed Gordeau was great in his day but was washed up. Scott Ledoux refereed the match. It was a nothing match with a terrible finish. Bordeaux did a pro wrestling eye rake to Johnson once and was warned. Johnston came back and got an armbar and Gordeaux I raked him again. Johnson sold it like he was blinded and Gordeaux started kicking him at will knocking him out of the ring. At this point Dave Benito, in Johnston's corner, jumped in the ring after Gordeaux and Igor Mindert went after Benito and it was ruled no contest. Fans hated this match. Gordeaux got on the mic after the match and said that where he comes from, there are no rules in fighting. Johnston and Mindert brawled in the aisle after the match. 2 stars, 6. Naoi Ogawa beat Don Fry in 742. Fry is almost as good as Steve Austin for Persona, although obviously nowhere close for working. They showed an angle they did where Ogawa was mad at Fry for doing tag matches for New Japan and Fry said he works for New Japan because they pay him. They ended up having words and doing a pull-apart brawl on the street to set up this match. Ogawa trimmed down from 285 to 253 and actually had a presentable looking body, but not much charisma. Fortunately, Fry has enough charisma for two wrestlers, but neither had the ability to carry it. This wasn't good. Finish saw Ogawa get a choke in the middle and the ref stopped it. Of course they had the typical post-match scene in a Fry match. He jumped Ogawa and they were threatening each other and having a pull-apart. In the brawl, Fry attacked Kazunari, setting up their proposed main event match. 
Fry then started yelling at Inoki at ringside serving as something of a commissioner type role. Fry then did an interview saying he got screwed since he never tapped and said that UFO screwed him since the ref was supposed to be Ledoux. He said that he wanted to work for New Japan and not UFO and said it was all a conspiracy of Inoki, Sayama and Ogawa to get to the ref to beat him. One quarter of a star. Mexico. The current plan is for the beginning of the WCW invasion to be on December 4th at Arena Mexico with Hector Garza, Vampiro and Dandy on the show. It appears Vampiro has cut his own deal apart from WCW, and he may be coming in to work a program with Ryo de Jalisco Jr. over the CMLL heavyweight title over the next few weeks. Box E Lucha reported this week that Conan, La Parca, Silver King, Tarzan Boy, Psicosis, Juventud Guerrera, Mosco de la Merced and Vampiro were all being talked about as coming in and that Conan and Alonza this week are scheduled to have a meeting to come up with booking ideas for the program. It appears that Sonny Wanu will largely coordinate the angle for WCW and work as the heel manager of the WCW crew. Ideas have been given for Wanu to feud with Paco Alonso, but Alonso is an old-school promoter that doesn't want to be involved in angles. That magazine also listed all the championships held by El Satanico, who has held more major titles than any wrestler in the history of Lucha Libre. Satanico's 24-year career includes five reigns as NWA middleweight champion, three as NWA world light heavyweight champion, two as UA world middleweight, five as Mexican national middleweight, four as CMLL middleweight, two as CMLL light heavyweight, three as part of CMLL trios and once as FMW world light heavyweight. Alonso has claimed to WCW that neither Negro Casas, or El Ejo del Santo have signed their WWF deals. WWF sources indicate both have signed. Arena Mexico on November 20th was headlined by Bestia Salvaje and Scorpio Jr. and Black Warrior over El Ejo del Santo and Negro Casas and Felino when Salvaje pinned Santo after unmasking him. After the match, Santo and Casas challenged Salvaje and Scorpio for the CMLL tag titles, which should take place over the next three weeks. They did the match already on November 23rd in Puebla with Salvaje and Scorpio winning. In the semi, Fuerza Guerrera and Pierroth Jr. both turned on Universo 2000. They were facing Salomon Grundy in Atlantis and Lismark Sr. and wouldn't tag in, causing him to get pinned in both falls. After the match, Mascara Año 2000 did a run-in and attacked both men. November 27th is headlined by Pierroth and Guerrera and Grand Marcus Jr. vs. Los Hermanos Dinamita. Casas and Santo and Felino vs. Scorpio and Salvaje and Black Warrior and Mr. Niebla and Shocker and La Fiera vs. Satanico and Blue Panther and Zumbido. They are trying an interesting All Technicos match on November 24th at Arena Coliseo with Ryo, who has been complaining of really bad back pain and was x rayed and tested and given the OK to continue, and Lismark Sr. and Atlantis vs. Brasso de Oro and Brasso de Plata and T. Nieblas Jr. They did a weird deal which may or may not have been an angle and was reported to us as appearing not to have been on November 22nd at Arena Coliseo, in the Lismark Sr. vs. Guerrera singles match. Lismark collapsed in the ring after the first fall and was helped to the locker room. He ended up coming out for the next two falls, but they were both real quick and he was taken to the hospital for tests after the match but came out okay. Enrique Sirio beat Bat Blue in a hair vs. hair match at the AAA taping on November 20th in Plane Pontla. Archangel retained the Mexican national welterweight title on November 20th in Netzahualcoyote, beating Mascara Magica. The AAA major shows of the weekend were November 22nd in Monterey with Octagon and Latin Lover in Heavy Metal vs. Sandre Chicana and Cobarde and Espectro Jr. on top, and November 23rd in Nuevo Laredo, which may be the hottest city for pro wrestling in North America as AAA goes against the local Caesar Johnson promotion which runs the bullring with a big show at the local baseball stadium with Octagon and Heavy and Paro Agueo Jr. vs. Chicana and Espectro and Panther and Cobarde defends what is called the UWA Light Heavyweight Championship, which isn't the actual belt of that name, against Latin Lover. Jerry Estrada returned on the undercard. CMLL has opened a new arena called La Carpa Astros in Mexico City and will be running twice weekly shows on Wednesday and Saturdays to give the wrestlers more local work. Americans Alan Stone, Lady Victoria, Victoria Moreno, and Motocross, all originally from the San Bernardino, California area, have signed with CMLL. All Japan With a string of big TV ratings in late October, Peaking on November 1st for the Mitsuharu Misawa vs. Kenna Kobashi match, Nippon TV experimented with a 45-minute show, as opposed to the usual 30, on November 15th for Vader's All Japan debut, 
and will do another 45-minute show on December 6 airing the finals of the tag team tournament from the previous night. I believe the November 15th rating was a 2.5, which isn't anything special, but we'll have confirmation of the number next week. There is talk of expanding the show to 45 minutes regularly in February. The tag tourney continues to be largely successful built around Vader and Stan Hansen, although two of the four shows this week didn't sell out. In tournament matches November 18th in Okayama saw Hansen and Vader beat Kawada and Tao when Hansen lariated Kawada in 1142 before a sellout 2900 November 20th in Kumamoto before 2250 saw Johnny Ace and Bart Gunn, who are calling their team the movement. Beat Giant Kimala 2 and Gary Albright when Gunn pinned 2 in 957 and Kawada and Tao beat Misawa and Ogawa when Tao pinned Ogawa after a Nottawa. November 21st in Hiroshima before 3,600 saw Ace and Gun upset Misawa and Ogawa when Ace pinned Misawa which may have been Ace's first ever clean pinfall on the Triple Crown Champ in 1349. And Vader and Hansen beat Kobashi and Jun Akiyama when Hansen lariated Akiyama, while November 23rd in Hakata before a sellout 2,400 saw Vader and Hansen beat Kimala 2 and Albright in 923 when Vader used the Vader bomb on Kimala. Standings as of November 24th were, Vader and Hansen 4-0, and, and in their four wins included beating Misawa, Kawada and Kobashi's teams which would be the other three favorites going in, Ace and Gun 3-0, and zero, Kawada and Tao 3-1, and one, Kobashi and Akiyama 1-1, one and one, who at least as of original plans were scheduled to win Misawa and Ogawa 1-3, and three, Albright in 2-1-3, and three, had Hunters 1-3 and, and Yoshihiro Takayama and Takao Mori 0-3. Oh Gun has a totally new look with a very short buzz cut and one of the worst cases of gynecomastia I've ever seen on a wrestler, even worse than Rock at his worst. He's apparently continuing to do well on this tour. Baba worked a rare main event on November 23rd in Hakata teaming with Misawa and Ogawa to beat Kawada and Tao and Jun Izumaida. November 8th TV did a 2.1 rating. New Japan with the Tokyo Dome show in apparent disarray since Masahiro Chono vs. Keiji Muto isn't going to happen, they worked an angle with Atsushi Onita. Onita showed up on November 18th in Kyoto before 7,000 fans and hit the ring in the middle of the show. He took off his sunglasses and grabbed the mic from ring announcer Hideki Tanaka and started screaming for Riki Choshu to come out. First Shiro Koshinaka and members of Heisei Ishigun came out to yell at him. Finally Choshu came out. Onita handed Choshu an official written challenge, and Choshu ripped it up and threw it in his face and started kicking the hell out of Onita before the other New Japan wrestlers pulled him off. Onita ran from the ring, ran backstage and hopped in a cab and took off while Kensuke Sasaki, Choshu's protege, in the ring screamed for him to come back. New Japan's cover story was that they knew Onita was in town because he was trying to sell a show in Kyoto, but that they didn't expect he would come to their card. Several of the New Japan wrestlers issued challenges to Onita. They had Koshinaka challenge Onita to a match but told him he didn't want him bringing his gimmicks and foreign objects to the ring. Shinya Hashimoto said he'd face Onita under Onita's rules including an explosive match which Onita said he wanted to debut at the New Japan Big Show. Muto said that he personally has no respect for Onita and didn't like him even appearing in New Japan because he stole his gimmick when Onita copied Great Muto by doing the Great Nita gimmick a few years back. At press time the expectation was that New Japan would announce Sasaki as Onita's foe but that would be the beginning of the angle that would result in probably Choshu vs. Onita. However, no other matches were announced for the January 4th show and Satoru Sayama has yet to pick his five-man team for the New Japan vs. UFO series. Sayama claimed he's been busy trying to promote the December 30th UFO show, which also doesn't have any new matches announced. In tag team tournament matches November 18th in Kyoto saw Manabu Nakanishi and Yuji Nagata, who faces Don Fry in a singles match on December 4th in Osaka over Muto and Satoshi Koima when Nagata used the Nagata lock on Kojima in 15-15 and Sasaki and Kazuo Yamazaki beat tag champs Koshinaka and Genichiro Tenryu when Sasaki pinned Koshinaka in 13-38. November 21st in Fukushima before 1,850 saw Tenryu and Koshinaka over David Finley and Jerry Flynn. November 22nd at Karakuen Hall before a sellout 2100 saw Nakanishi and Nagata beat Sasaki and Yamazaki when Nakanishi made Sasaki submit to the torture rack in an upset in November 23rd in Tokyo before a sellout 2500 saw Nakanishi and Nagata over Flynn and Finley in 1257 and Hashimoto and Tatsumi Fujinami over Hiroyoshi Tenzan and NWO Sting when Hashimoto pinned Sting after a DDT in 1206. Standings as of November 24th were Fujinami and Hashimoto 2 and 0, Nagata and Nakanishi 3 and 1, Tenryu and Koshinaka 3 and 1, Sasaki and Yamazaki 1 and 1, 
Mudo and Kojima 0 and 2, Tenzan and Sting 0 and 2, and Flynn and Finley 0 and 2. They are doing an angle where Tenryu and Koshinaka want to defend their IWGP tag titles against Sasaki and Yamazaki on the war show on December 11 at Tokyo Kamazawa Olympic Gymnasium. New Japan has okayed the match but won't allow the belts to be at stake. Tenryu is claiming that if he can't defend his belts on his show, that he won't work the dome show for New Japan. November 7 TV show did a 2.2 rating. Other Japan notes. There were a lot of strange occurrences leading up to the November 20th FMW pay-per-view show at Yokohama Bunka Gym before a sellout crowd announced at 5,900, real number was 4,900. On November 17th, the story basically got out that Mr. Pogo and Shoji Nakamaki of Big Japan were scheduling a press conference for the next day in Tokyo to announce they were leaving and joining FMW, and probably the USO part of the company. FMW is going to split into different groups that each run their own shows, since in reality all of the wrestlers hate Onita and their ideas are that wrestling should be fun and entertainment and Onita can't get out of the sick brutality mindset that originally got him over, and he's desperate to get over again since he's largely dead to wrestling fans. Although the New Japan thing may get over just because he has mainstream name value and it's a big story him wrestling someone on a New Japan card because of the interpromotional deal. And there is always the interpromotional deal down the road when the two sides feud. Anyway, at the press conference, Pogo wasn't there. Shinya Kojika, who is 55 and whose background was decades as a pro wrestler, the owner of Big Japan, cancelled his November 18th and November 19th house shows for the Morioka area, hours away, and showed up in Tokyo and with reporters watching, got into a confrontation with Nakamaki literally in the street and proceeded to beat him up with Nakamaki basically getting pounded and not being able to offer the slightest bit of resistance. Nakamaki who is 41, has no athletic background as he was famous as a writer for a controversial inside baseball book who then got into pro wrestling and literally just takes punishment and slices his head open. The reporters for the most part said that it looked real and not like an angle, although most people around wrestling figured something like that had to be an angle. As it turned out both Pogo and Nakamaki showed up at the FMW pay-per-view show in an unannounced Onita vs Pogo match with Nakamaki in Pogo's corner. Despite renewing something of a legendary feud which drew great in its day, and with the big jumps amidst all the media pub, got no heat and was said to have bad. It wasn't the only change as not only did Bam Bam Bigelow not show up, but neither did Chris Condito and Tammy Sitch. Shuichi Arai, the FMW president, announced Condito and Sitch weren't going to be there on November 19th and said FMW was mad at ECW over what happened and hinted they would cut off all relations with ECW. Things appear to have been smoothed out as ECW sent Sabu and One Man Gang as replacements, and Sabu is a much bigger star in Japan than Condito, although FMW had Sitch booked for public appearances in Japan as she's very marketable in that culture as they have a thing in Japan for blonde-haired models. Sabu ended up winning a three-way dance over Gang and Yukihiro Kanemura. Ghetto and Jado vs. Condito and Bigelow wound up being changed to an eight-man with Ghetto and Jado teaming with Takamichi Noku and Shoichi Fanaki to beat Naohiko Yamazaki and Riki Fuji and Mohamed Yone and Daisuke Ikeda. Ray Bukanero of EMLL was the only other foreigner to work the show, beating Flying Kid Ichihara in the opener. In the main event, Hiramichi Fuyuki captured the FMW version of the World Heavyweight title from Hayabusa in 25-11. After the match, Fuyuki who began his career in All Japan and years back formed a tag team with Toshiaki Kawada, said since he won the title he wanted to wrestle the top stars of All Japan. Misawa responded there is no way and Baba basically called him foolish for bringing it up. There was tremendous heat in All Japan when Fuyuki originally left with Genichiro Tenryu to form the old SWS promotion. FMW is now doing a single elimination tournament starting December 9th in Osaka and ending January 5th at Karakuen Hall with Misao Orihara vs. Fuji, Haido vs. X, Hideki Hasaka vs. Kanemura, Mr. Ganesuk vs. Koji Nakagawa, Kasaku vs. X, Super Leather vs. Tetsuhiro Kuroda, Fuyuki vs. Hiskatsu Oya and Ghetto vs. Hayabusa as first round matches. If you're looking for evidence that the Kojika slash Nakamaki deal wasn't an angle, it may be there as word is out that Kojika is going to file a breach of contract lawsuit against both men. Kojika, in a bind, was able to lure Takashi Ishikawa, 45 who he worked with seemingly forever in all Japan, out of retirement, and he starts up with Big Japan in a few days. Battlers ran the biggest show in its history on November 23rd at Tokyo Sumo Hall before about 6,000 fans. President Yuki Ishikawa designed the show as something nostalgic based on his childhood as a pro wrestling fan, and his heroes, Antonio Inoki, 
Bob Backlund, Vader and the Road Warriors when pro wrestling aired at 8 p.m. on network television. 8 was the theme of the show all the way to announcing 8,888 as the attendance which was a worked figure decided by Ishikawa ahead of time to pay tribute to his childhood. The closing scene of the show was Ishikawa, playing the role of Inoki, using the octopus submission to beat Backlund in a late 70s style match in 2208. From what we understand, the finish didn't work because Ishikawa couldn't do the move right. Earlier in the semifinals of the B Cup, Ishikawa beat Oya for FMW and Backlund used the chicken wing crossface, another 70s move, to beat great Sasuke in 1620. Fans were said to be a lot more into Backlund vs. Sasuke than Backlund vs. Ishikawa. However, the show was considered a success since they drew almost as many fans as UFO did on October 24th for its debut show and more fans than Michinoku Pro did last year at Sumo Hall bringing in Undertaker and Sonny. Road Warriors in 80s fashion destroyed Mohamed Yone and Alexander Otska in just 4.33 when they did the double impact, doomsday device, on Otska, coming off being one of Japan's hottest wrestlers for his win over Marco Ruiz in the Tokyo Dome in Valley Tudo. Otsuka was over huge in this match and apparently was glad to put over two of his heroes growing up to the point that after the match he got on the PA and said the Road Warriors were much tougher than Ruiz. In a prelim match, Victor Kruger came out with mask and Vader headgear reminiscent of the night 11 years ago that Vader debuted at Sumo Hall and pinned Inoki. In a prelim match rookies Minoru Fujita and Iku Tohidaka, who were real good junior heavy newcomers and recently won the big Japan tag tourney, lost to Michinoku and Funaki from WWF. Momoe Nakanishi and Nani Takahashi, who are both 19 years old, captured All Japan Women's Annual Tag Team Tournament which ended on November 22nd at Karakuen Hall before about 1,300 fans. In the finals, they went to a 30-minute straw with Yumiko Hata and Manami Toyota, but since they had a better record in the round robin, they were the tourney winners. The November 29th Pankrace show in Osaka will be a series of five matches from two teams with the matches being drawn in the ring when the show starts. The December 19th pay-per-view show will be headlined by Guy Mesger defending the King of Pancrase title against Yuki Kondo, plus Valley Tudo rules matches with Masakatsu Funaki vs. John Rankin of Peoria, Illinois and Keiichiro Yamamiya vs. Jeremy Horn, who has fought and lost on the past two UFC shows but is most noted for lasting 1630 before losing to Frank Shamrock. I'm not sure what the purpose is of Funaki doing his first ever Valley Tudo fight, but putting him against someone with no reputation so he basically has nothing to gain by winning, and everything to lose by losing. Rings ran the second set of first round matches in its annual Battle Dimension tournament before 4,380 fans on November 20th in Osaka. In a huge surprise the favorite Japan B team which has the two biggest stars in the company Tsuyoshi Kosaka, Kiyoshi Tamura and Masayuki Naruse, lost to Russia B, Vladimir Klementiev, Andrei Kovalov and Nikolai Zuev, and was eliminated. After Zuev beat Tamura in 3-17 with an armbar, it left Zuev versus Kosaka, and they went to a 10-minute straw. The judges, ruling over the five matches, then awarded the overall decision to Russia. The other first round saw Gruzia, rings heavyweight champ Bisade Teriel, Bisade Milan and Grom Zaza, beating Australia Daniel Higgins, Troy Inson and Christopher Hazeman by a 3-1 score which saw the upset with prelim fighter Hazeman beating world champ Terriel in 157 before losing to Milan. This puts the Netherlands vs. Japan A and Gruzia vs. Russia B in the semifinals on December 23rd in Fukuoka with the finals on January 16th at Budokan Hall. The February 21st Akira Maeda vs. Alexander Karelin match at Yokohama Arena is being scaled for a sellout to be the biggest indoor gate of the year as a sellout would be about $1.75 million which I believe is more than WrestleMania is scaled for in Philadelphia. Saw photos of the Kyoko Inoue match against the male Muay Thai fighter from November 14th. Inoue's low drop kick wasn't to the knee at the bell but squarely aimed at the groin but she connected literally inches too high to do damage. Perinya Giat Buzabar her opponent who not only has women's facial features but wore Muay Thai shorts and a women's sports bra top, did a hell of a number on her with kicks and knees to the face. She wound up with a nasty kick above her left eye, which was swollen shut with the blood running into it. The December 26th multi-promotional women's show at Tokyo Ariaki Coliseum which will be the Jaguar Yokota retirement show, will be headlined by Yokota vs. Devil Masami, who were big rivals and later tag team partners in the early 80s. The latest incarnation of the Kingdom promotion debuts on December 11th in Toyama with Yoji Anjo vs. Nick Starks, Yoshiaki Fujiwara vs. Billy Scott and Tatsuo Nakano vs. James Stone, Little Guido and ECW as the top matches, here and there.
the International Wrestling Institute and Museum in Newton, Iowa has scheduled its first inductions in its George Tragos Luthes Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame as Frank Gotch, Strangler Lewis, Thez, and Vern Gagne at a big weekend gathering from April 23rd to April 25th in conjunction with the 1999 Cauliflower Alley Banquet. There will be a Hall of Fame banquet on April 23rd. Induction ceremonies with live appearances by Thez and Gagne on April 24th, the Cauliflower Alley Banquet which will honor Tragus, his original wrestling coach, with members of his family attending, later that evening and a reception. They will also be having a tribute for the late boxer Rocky Marciano, who died in 1969 in a plane crash in Newton, Iowa. For more info call 515-791-1517. The museum, dedicated to both amateur and pro wrestling, is located 30 miles east of Des Moines on Interstate 80 and several readers who were there for the grand opening in September were raving about the place. On the Memphis Power Pro Show, Aaron O'Grady kept the Young Guns title in a triple threat over Kid Wicket and Derek King. Brandon Baxter showed up in the parking lot calling Randy Hales out but Hales didn't respond, saying he had a TV show to run. Veteran Don Bass returned. This was largely a backdrop for Hales bringing the syndicate, Vic Grimes, Sean Stassi and Baldo outside to take care of Baxter, but when they got out there Baxter was on the roof of the TV studio and threw a bucket of water on Hales. The Irish assassin, Mick Tierney, another wrestler under a WWF developmental deal, debuted doing a shooter-slash-submission expert gimmick. Tierney has done MMA fighting including a match in Russia losing to Oleg Tokhtarov. TV main was Jerry Lawler and Stacy vs. Bill Dundee and Samantha. During the show, Dundee said he was tired of always wrestling Lawler, Lawler during the show mentioned he had just returned from New York shooting the final scenes in Man on the Moon, he and Jim Carrey shot scenes reprising the famous Lawler slash Andy Kaufman angle on the David Letterman show. Sean Stasiak came out and started hitting on Stacy and Samantha and had them rub his abs and he puckered up but they both slapped him in the face. Lawler and Dundee stopped fighting each other and both attacked Stasiak and ran him off. After Stasiak left, Lawler and Dundee were shoving each other around. Someone who was at the NWA anniversary show on October 24th and timed the matches said that the Dan Severn vs. Steve Regal match actually went 26-10, and throughout the match they were regularly shaving time, which they did in some of the undercard matches as well, and announced it was 31-10. Some more notes as it relates to the USWF and Amarillo and the American Combat Pancradion show on November 7th in Lubbock that was shut down the a district judge. While the November 7th show did have rules, it was also being advertised as no-holds-barred fighting and ultimate fighting in certain circles, terms that have a more negative connotation than shoot wrestling. Right now, USWF in Texas is considered like pro wrestling and not regulated by a state athletic commission, although there is movement to possibly put USWF under regulations similar by the commission that handles boxing and create rules to cater to shoot fighting. The New York Daily News will be doing a huge story this weekend on superstar Billy Graham as the guy whose gimmicks spawned both Hulk Hogan and Jesse Ventura. Due to another family emergency, Graham has had to postpone his latest hip replacement surgery which was scheduled for this week for about another two or three months. The story idea came from a November 8th story in the same paper where Ventura talked about the first time he saw Graham wrestle in 1973. ESPN Magazine is preparing a story on Ventura. Add a potential movie on the life of gorgeous George to the list of projects that are being considered to ride the coattails of wrestling's current popularity. The San Antonio Express did a two-page feature over the weekend and local wrestling legend Jose Lothario, who is planning on opening a pro wrestling school next year with Shawn Michaels, and his shows which feature his son Pete. The EMLL television show, which has been bounced around with no set time slot on Galavision, is expected to get a regular 7 p.m. Saturday night time slot starting on December 11th. Some notes about former Alabama rep Tom Drake and his wrestling career. Drake definitely did wrestle professionally as there are records of him as an opening match wrestler on some early 70s shows in Birmingham, although the exploits as a wrestler listed in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution article appear to have been exaggerated. He worked as a special referee in Chattanooga for some main events in 1954 based on his college football credentials and wrestled in that area from time to time but not as a major star. Music City Wrestling will be one of the new companies running major Thanksgiving spectaculars this week, with a show headlined by Brickhouse Brown and Flash Flanagan vs. Stephen Dunn and Reno Riggins. Colorado Kid had split up his long association with Burt Prentice, you know, the storyline won, and will face Prentice's mystery opponent. It wasn't all that many years ago that Thanksgiving was the biggest night of the year for the pro wrestling industry. 
it appears that former AWA and WWF TV announcer Ken Resnick is getting the lead announcing job for the new roller derby show and that Missy Hyatt is trying out for an interviewer role. Hyatt has also quit her job working as a bartender and is looking at getting back into working weekends doing indie pro wrestling gigs, particularly in places like Texas, Louisiana and Georgia where she made her biggest name. USA Pro Wrestling on December 5th in Howell, New Jersey at Lakewood Prep School has Tito Santana vs. Honky Tonk Man, Jimmy Snuka vs. Iron Sheik plus Demolition Axe, Tommy Cairo, Devin Storm, Ace Darling, Cousin Luke and Mike Quackenbush wrestling and appearing for autographs and photos include Bruno Sammartino, Ken Patera, and Nikolai Volkov. For more info you can call 1-800-582-5541 and if you mention The Observer you can get $1 off any ticket. Terry Funk and Abdullah the Butcher went to a DDQ on November 21st in Kaiser, West Virginia before 550 fans in continuing one of the all-time legendary feuds in pro wrestling history. New Jack will headline Midwest Renegade Wrestling on December 12th in Cape Girardeau, Missouri at the National Guard Armory. Speaking of ECW wrestlers, Blue Meanie and Supernova captured the Steel City Tag Team titles beating High Society for the vacant belts at the TV tapings on November 22nd in Irwin, Pennsylvania. Harley Race and Gordon Soley have resurfaced at the first TV taping for World Legion Wrestling out of Springfield, Missouri, which starts appearing on the American Independent Network on December 15th and on the America One Network in January. Race has an on-TV role as the head of the championship committee and Soley worked as a ring announcer for the tapings. There were a lot of wrestlers that appeared on the recent NBC special involved as the promoter was Bill Ash. One of the TV announcers was Doc Savage, who pretty much put together the NBC special and was the most prominent wrestler on the show and Romeo Valentino on the special work this show, as did Dan Severn as NWA champion, Butch Reed and Mabel. With Race and Soli, WLW is doing an old-school gimmick with Severn as champion and that all title matches are two of three falls and the title can change hands by a DQ. MMA The January 8th show is already undergoing major changes from the lineup listed last week. Alan Goes, scheduled to face Jerry Bolander, is out with a legit broken shoulder. Andre Pedernaris, scheduled to face Pat Militic for the lightweight title, also suffered a shoulder injury and has pulled out. At this point, nothing has been decided as it regards both scheduled matches. Carlos Newton, scheduled to face Evan Tanner, has pulled out due to personal reasons and looks to be replaced by Daryl Golar, who is a former U.S. national champion in Greco-Roman wrestling that is being trained by Boss Rutan. There seems to be a lot of question about the future of Frank Shamrock in UFC after his turning down the three-fifths pay-per-view date to fight Vitor Belfort. It was generally expected that Shamrock would be at the January 8th show to do commentary and build up for a future match with Belfort. There seems to be an attitude in Semaphore Entertainment Group that why put Shamrock on the show for commentary and promote him if he's not going to fight. There are a lot of ideas being looked at but it appears Semaphore Entertainment Group doesn't want to run both a January and a March show with both Shamrock and Belfort who appear to be the company's two biggest stars at this point, on neither show, and there's the other end of not wanting to risk the fight by putting Belfort against someone tough to where he may not look as impressive as his last fight, and it would be hard to look any more impressive than in that fight, but nobody wants to see a victim with no chance simply handed to Belfort either. It would also look real bad right now for UFC to have its heavyweight champion be stripped of the title basically over a financial dispute, and in a rare case, UFC got lucky to an extent when Ensign Inoue beat Randy Couture one week later in only 139 although to the best of our knowledge, UFC has not extended an invitation to Inoue to come in and have the middleweight champion be stripped as well, although there has been at least discussion of that. From Shamrock's standpoint, he doesn't want to face Belfort without it financially being worth it and Semaphore Entertainment Group has cut the budget way back for UFC. There is a sad fact of business fighting that nobody has proven it better than the example set by the Gracies, in that it often can better to walk away after a big win and become this fighting legend rather than risk it constantly against dangerous opponents. However, if Shamrock doesn't fight in UFC anytime soon, he'll likely take a fight in Japan. He is also up for a recurring role in the TV show Walker, Texas Ranger. With all the major upsets in the heavyweight division at the October Shooto, Pride in UFC shows, Fighting Sports News in its new issues lists the top 10 heavyweights as, in order, Mark Kerr, Igor Vachinchin, Tsuyoshi Kosaka, Tom Erickson, Couture, Maurice Smith, Pedro Rizzo, Inoue, Pete Williams, and Mark Coleman. The Super Brawl show on November 18th in Guam was taped and will air on the local NBC affiliate. How's this for a switch for a politician? Lieutenant Governor Madeline Bordallo of Guam was at the show and presented an award to Ensign Inoue for his win over Randy Couture in Japan. Inoue recently opened the Pure Bread Gym in Guam. 
ECW. Chris Condito and Tammy Sitch are officially on a leave of absence to tend to personal issues after missing the FMW pay-per-view show. The two cancelled several flights to Japan as Condito had said his grandmother was on her deathbed, and it wound up after the last miss and with FMW already hot about Bam Bam Bigelow cancelling, that Paul Heyman got Sabu to do the show. All of Sitch's merchandise was removed from the gimmick table and they are no longer being advertised as appearing for any upcoming shows. The January 10th pay-per-view show may be moved from Kissimmee, Florida, which holds less than 3,000, to the Knight Center in Miami, which holds 5,970. A decision was going to be made this week. The tentative plans besides what has already been announced are Tommy Dreamer vs. Just Incredible in some sort of a gimmick match, Rob Van Dam vs. Masato Tanaka for the TV title, and the Dudleys vs. Axel Rotten and Balls Mahoney in some sort of a gimmick match. They've gotten the okay to raise the price from $19.95 to $21.95 for pay-per-view starting with the next show, and are hoping to get it up to $24.95 by the follow-up show on March 21st. ECW starts back on the MSG Network at 1 a.m. on Saturday nights in January. The show will also be moving from Thursday night to Friday night in Chicago, and from Friday night to Thursday night in Detroit as WWF bought the ECW Friday night Detroit time slot. They have given up the idea of trying to buy onto Fox Sports Los Angeles because the price tag was too high, but are in negotiations for broadcast TV in that market. Terry Funk should be returning unannounced on two or three house shows before the pay-per-view. Tanaka will be returning to Japan on December 3rd. He's homesick and has talked of not returning full-time, although the plan originally was for him to stay as a regular through June. ECW is looking at starting its own newsstand magazine early next year. They seem to hint on TV of an impending Dudley's vs. Public Enemy feud as it was brought up that Dudley's fifth tag title reign breaks the record set by Public Enemy. As it stands now, there is no deal to bring Public Enemy, who have been released by WCW, in. Public Enemy themselves are hoping more to be picked up by WWF, and anything is possible, but since WWF already has the oddities, I can't see it. Paul Heyman has stated many times he'd bring Public Enemy in for a short run with the Dudleys but isn't interested in using them long term. This past week aired a good TV match with Lance Storm beating Mikey Whipwreck due to outside help from Jerry Lynn, and a bad title match with Shane Douglas vs. Spike Dudley. November 21st at ECW Arena before the regular packed house was said to have been an average or below average show. It opened with Douglas offering Taz a title shot if he can eliminate Sabu from contention, and also Douglas asked for Taz to be his partner in the main event against Sabu and Van Dam. Spike Dudley beat Mr. Hughes, who was said to have looked bad. Chris Chetty and Supernova and Blue Meanie beat Amish Roadkill and Danny During and Skull Von Crush. Van Dam kept the TV title beating Rod Price in a match described as okay at best. Little Guido beat Mike Lozanski in a bad match. The two best matches followed with Storm beating Lin when Whipwreck interfered, followed by Storm beating Whipwreck when Lin interfered. John Cronus and New Jack had a no contest. They had an angle stemming from New Jack doing a TV interview saying he carried Cronus all along. They had an angle where Lance Wright and Cronus were to bring that up and set up the match, which apparently made sense on paper but was executed so poorly that it killed the match. Credible and Dudley's beat Tanaka and Mahoney and Dreamer and the show ended with Sabu and Van Dam over Taz and Douglas when Sabu beating Douglas with an Arabian facebuster followed by the camel clutch. After the match Taz dropped Sabu on his head with A his katajim dropped into a move similar to the Cobra clutch suplex and they played it up huge with Sabu going out on a stretcher. WCW Matches that appear likely for Starcade are Goldberg vs. Nash, Flair vs. Bischoff with some sort of stipulation, Page vs. Hart, Mysterio Jr. vs. Guerrera and Saturn vs. Ernest Miller. Nitro on November 23rd in Grand Rapids, Michigan drew a sellout 10248 paying $275,322. Luger beat Mike Enos in 604 with a rack. Enos is really underrated and since they put Luger out there first, the match had a ton of heat. Kidman did an interview and called out Mysterio Jr. and offered him a title shot later in the show. Eddie Guerrero then came out and told Mysterio Jr. that he was under a binding contract to stay in the LWO. Benoit beat Norman Smiley in 310 with a crossface. Smiley was playing to the crowd far more than he ever has in WCW and the crowd was into the match. Wolfpack came out and did their catchphrases and little else. They went backstage and had a second brief verbal confrontation with Nash and Goldberg, a first was at the open of the show as both were pulling into the parking lot. Canyon beat Magnum Tokyo in 201 with the flatliner. 
Canyon debuted a Russian leg sweep off the middle rope. Bobby Duncombe Jr. pinned Glacier after a move similar to a flatliner in 432. No heat at all. Duncombe has inherited Hector Garza's old ring music. The Giant challenged Goldberg to a title match. Saturn beat Silver King with the Death Valley driver in 342. Ernest Miller and Sonny Wanu were watching from the stage. Heard these two had a real good match earlier in the week on the Saturday night taping but this was a one-sided match with Saturn not giving Silver King a thing. Saturn badly needs to lose that vest. Kidman beat Mysterio Jr. in a title match in 946 with the Shooting Star Press when Eddie Guerrero and Juventud Guerrera did a run-in giving Mysterio Jr. the Juvie driver. This was the old Mysterio Jr. as he looked real good and even invented two new spots. Bischoff and Flair had a face-to-face -face confrontation. Flair called out Barry Wyndham. Bischoff predicted, a la Vince McMahon, that Wyndham would end up knocking Flair out. Flair acting ridiculously naive for a 26-year veteran, said no way. Way. Bischoff slapped Flair. Flair went after him and Wyndham and Bischoff did a number on Flair. Wyndham looks to become Bischoff's new bodyguard. The horseman tried to save Flair who was KO'd and Bischoff was kicking the hell out of him, but they were all jumped by black and white and left laying, with Malenko selling a knee injury. Bischoff then told Malenko he had to wrestle Hart later in the show. This segment was a lot weaker than it should have been. Conan beat Booker T via DQ in 347 when Stevie Ray came out for no reason, and hit Conan with a slapjack. T was mad at Ray for costing him the match. Nice to see nobody help Conan as he was getting pounded. Hart challenged Page to a match. Nash pinned Rath in 445 with the power bomb. It's absolutely amazing how huge Nash really is. As mentioned often, size in this business is an illusion and Rath's gimmick as a huge monster was pretty well destroyed because of just how small he looks next to Nash. Both worked real hard and Nash bumped like hell for Rath, who looked good before losing in a match that had good heat. Jericho came out for an hilarious interview. He mentioned he debuted as cowboy Chris Jericho for Stampede Wrestling from Casper, Wyoming in his first pro match. While he was doing the interview, Duncombe brought Ralphus out all hog-tied. Ralphus is getting over huge. Hall beat Alex Wright with the edge in 321. Malenko beat Hart via DQ in their first ever meeting in 1614. This was a good old style match with Malenko selling the knee from the earlier injury and Hart working on it most of the way. The crowd heat wasn't there again even though it was technically good and actually told a story. This could have been a great match in another setting. Malenko made the big comeback but his knee went out again. Hart wound up giving him the diamond cutter on a chair for the DQ. Page made the save after the match, called Hart a woos, and challenged him for the main event of the November 30th Nitro. They had earlier explained that all the horsemen except Malenko had left the building for no logical reason except to explain Page saving the horsemen once again. Finally Goldberg jackhammered Giant in 134. Bigelow ran in and they ha a pull apart. As Bigelow was dragged out Nash ran in and then had a pull apart until the show went off the air. They taped another hour for Tuesday with nothing eventful happening except Mysterio Jr. interfering causing Guerrero to lose to Prince Iao Kia. The announcers appeared punchy from having done so much television over three days. The crowd was absolutely dead and the wrestlers were exhausted being out there so late with no crowd enthusiasm and with the exception of Chavo vs. Magnum, every match was bad. Stevie Ray vs. Van Hammer was so horrible that it really has to be seen to be believed, like a 330 Reader's Digest version of Hogan vs. Warrior but, with a comatose crowd. Rick Steiner has been pulled from all shows for the rest of the year due to his recent shoulder surgery. However, on television, they haven't even acknowledged his latest injury. It's official that the Goldberg vs. Flair program is off the books. Booker T has also been pulled from his house show bookings over the next month. Flair's first match back will be at Starcade, which was his original agreement. On December 16th in Columbia, South Carolina, Flair will be replaced by McMichael with Benoit and Malenko vs. Hart and Ray, replacing Hall and Hannigan the main event, but Flair will appear in the Horseman Corner. Flair also manages Benoit, who wrestles Hart in the main event dark match at the December 17th Thunder tapings in Charlotte, which may be Benoit's first true singles main event in WCW. WCW put tickets on sale over the weekend for December 18th in Tulsa headlined by Goldberg. In his first match back in the city he grew up in against Giant and the show sold out 5,500 tickets for $90,000 in three hours. December 20th revised house show card in Kansas City, $225,000 advance, is now Bigelow replacing Flair in the main event against Goldberg, plus Page vs. Hart, Nash vs. Giant, Lou vs. Scott Steiner, T vs. Hennig, Benoit and Malenko vs. Guerrero in Jericho.
Conan vs. Ray and Saturn vs. Finley. Revised shows for December 29th at Nassau Coliseum and December 30th at the Spectrum in Philadelphia are both Goldberg vs. Bigelow, Page vs. Hart, Nash vs. Giant, Flair vs. Hull, Luger vs. Scott Steiner, T vs. Hennig, Benoit and Malenko vs. Guerrero and Jericho, Conan vs. Ray and Saturn vs. Finley. As of November 24th, the Nassau Advance is 7,374 tickets for $266,990 as compared with WWF in Madison Square Garden two days earlier which is at the same point in time is at 10,783 tickets for $342,895 with Austin vs. Bossman with Austin getting 5 minutes with Vince if he wins and Rock vs. Kane as the headline matches. Nitro December 7th at the Houston Astrodome is roughly 23,000 tickets for $610,000 and December 21st at St. Louis TWA Dome is about 27,000 tickets for $880,000. WCW has entered into a partnership agreement with American Vantage Cause and Sitka Restaurant Group Incorporated to develop WCW slash NWO Nitro restaurants, the first of which will be at the Excalibur in Las Vegas opening in the spring. Phil Mushnick in TV Guide will be doing an article in a few weeks on the Bret Hart movie. The movie got tremendous reviews in Canada last weekend. I was really curious how non-wrestling fans who are movie reviewers would see this because my experience is that non-fans see a very different movie than serious wrestling fans. Actually serious wrestling fans see it best because they see it as more complex than the simple good versus evil emotional portrayals of Hart and McMahon or the moral struggle of idealism versus pragmatic businessmen that the movie in a sense tries to simplify some very complex issues into. This is not meant as a knock because its desired audience was not wrestling fans but a casual audience and they didn't sacrifice historical accuracy in order to make a more entertaining movie and instead presenting things largely as they were, without all the complexities of real life. For whatever this is worth, when Jim Ross called the movie amateurish on his hotline report, which he did, the only version he saw was an early rough cut which the producers sent to WWF. You'll know when they got the rough cut because it's the same time they started doing all their booking largely as both preparation and response to the release of the movie. That first rough cut was quite primitive in comparison with the eventual final copy. More notes from the Saturday night taping on November 17th in Salina, Kansas before 2768 paying $60,340. Kidman beat Eddie Guerrero via DQ when the LWO ran into attack Kidman and Mysterio Jr. made the save. Lodi beat Barry Darso when Darso clocked him with his putter. Saturn beat Silver King in a good match. Poor Magnum Tokyo had to job for Vincent. Hart worked a Saturday night main event getting DQ'd against T. Guerrero beat Super Kolo in the best match of the taping. They did yet another angle where Miller destroyed Hayashi. Speaking of Hayashi, they had Norton beat him in 20 seconds on Tuesday Nitro. Kidman beat Mysterio Jr. in a title match via DQ when Mysterio Jr. was on the verge of winning and the LWO attacked Kidman for the DQ. DDP beat Ray via DQ when Hart attacked DDP, and then in a dark match DDP beat Hart. DDP is putting together a major fundraiser on December 12th and December 13th in Asbury Park, New Jersey, where he grew up, to benefit the learning center of Asbury Park. A lot of the WCW wrestlers are appearing headlined by Page vs. Giant. Despite rumors flying everywhere to the contrary, there has been no advertising in the Memphis market that Randy Savage would be appearing at the December 3rd Thunder. Savage will be returning fairly soon with a new valet, his current girlfriend, a 22-year-old said to be a Pamela Anderson lookalike. Three guesses on her previous occupation, and the first two don't count. Thunder on November 19th in Fort Wayne, Indiana drew a sellout 6,423 paying $143,265. The show also drew a 3.72 rating and 5.7 share. T beat Smiley in 327 of a match where they missed every single spot. T clearly is nowhere close to 100% Hall beat Disco with the edge in 237. Guerrero took Mysterio's match with Kidman and Guerrero got the pin using the ropes in 539. This would make sense if it was to set Eddie up for a cruiserweight title match, but since Eddie is no longer a cruiserweight, which has nothing to do with weight, being a cruiserweight is based on whether or not you've complained to management yet about being called a cruiserweight. That result further establishes the cruiser champ as a guy who can't beat any heavyweights. Norton destroyed Scott Putsky in 148 with a power bomb. Throughout the show they painted poor Kaz Hayashi as this retarded child who couldn't speak enough English, holding this Japanese English dictionary trying to get someone to be his tag partner against Miller and Wanu at the pay-per-view. Finally Saturn agreed. As Miller was beating up Hayashi once again, Saturn made the save and the heels ran away. 
Wright beat Chavo with a folding press in 736 of an OK match. After the match, Wright beat up Pepe but Chavo made a comeback. If they ever run that interpromotional pay-per-view, they can make it that Pepe has a crush on the head and that they can have a horse-human wedding with Mr. Sacco presiding over it. Canyon beat Aokia in 416. Rath beat Saturn in 609 when Miller kicked Saturn. Match had no heat and Rath took way too many bumps for Saturn. Finally Hart beat Conan in 319 when Ray KO'd Conan with a slapjack and Hart put him in the sharpshooter. Goldberg has opened a 27,000 square foot gym in Atlanta with both weights and conditioning equipment and fighting training with Tim Cattlefo, who has fought Bally Tudo in Brazil. Cattlefo, who has trained submissions with many of the WCW wrestlers, is training with Goldberg so he can learn more real submission maneuvers. Bobby Heenan missed the Thunder taping because his mother-in-law died. For some reason the company felt it would hurt Heenan's character, I guess to admit he actually cared about his mother-in-law, so they instead said he was in Detroit doing advance work for the pay-per-view show. The horsemen were all in Fort Wayne and none were used which caused some heat. Among the ideas batted around are combining the NWO back into one group as heels, although obviously since the idea is to rid the NWO of the dud guys, they'll end up being cheered. Sting and possibly Conan would remain faces and possibly feud with them. It appears likely WCW is just going to eat Warrior's contract as they didn't even bring him to Auburn Hills for the pay-per-view, and he wasn't brought to Nitro either. Rath's contract expires in January and he's negotiating a new deal. He probably won't be doing the Gladiator movie he was up for because it would require 40 weeks of filming in Morocco. WKFG, Channel 6 in Orlando recently did a piece with Dana Hall, there will be a three-hour Best of 1998 WCW special on TNT on December 30th. Raven has been out of action because he has a head injury which resulted in this huge lump. With him out of action, this led to strange matches at the house shows with Malenko and Benoit beating Canyon and Saturn. Sandman will likely be involved in a program with Raven's group. House shows this week were November 18th in Topeka drawing 3448 paying $75,966, and November 20th in Toledo drawing a sellout 4,500 paying $98,688. Merchandise for the week not including Auburn Hills was $225,848 or $8.25 per head, which is rising from the standard of the past two months. WCW Saturday night on November 21st did a 2.6 rating. WWF the WWF has purchased a $1.6 million 30 seconds fought during the Super Bowl game on January 31st. The commercial hasn't been designed yet but apparently it'll have something to do with making a major announcement for WrestleMania. The plan right now is for Hunter Hearst Helmsley to return at the November 29th tapings in Philadelphia although he likely won't wrestle until the December 6th pay-per-view show in the United Kingdom. China was brought back for angle purposes at the last show although the swelling from the surgery too, among other things, correct her jaw misalignment, advanced TMJ, corrected by first breaking and then resetting her jaw which is said to be a very painful surgery, hadn't gone done and she looked really bad on camera. The second night of the tapings, recognizing that, they had her come up with high heels and in a leather outfit which is the first time she's dressed in anything feminine since coming to the WWF. Rock filmed an episode of USA Network's The Net in Vancouver just before Survivor Series. The role was produced to where it could be recurring dependent upon whether his appearance will spike the ratings like Sable and Triple H have done with Pacific Blue this season. It'll be a little more difficult because Pac Blue followed heat and basically maintained, while The Net is on Saturday night with no pro wrestling on USA anywhere near its time slot. Mark Canterbury will be undergoing neck surgery to fuse his vertebrae and is expected out of action at least another three or four months. Steve Williams is expected back in about one month. Steven Regal was sent home in the middle of the tour this past week because he was in no condition to perform. Aside from his theme song, up to this point he's been a huge disappointment for a guy who when signed was being looked at as being a potential title contender for Austin. Jeff Jarrett also went home early due to the death of his grandmother. The angle where mankind was so pathetically naive to think Vince McMahon was like a father figure was yet another spoof of the movie, as there is a scene where Bret Hart talks about McMahon like he's a father figure to him. WrestleMania tickets will be going on sale soon for the show in Philadelphia priced from $400 down to $25. December 27th in Madison Square Garden, and likely the same lineup on December 26th in Chicago, as Austin vs. Bossman with Austin getting 5 minutes with McMahon if he wins, Rock vs. Kane for the WWF title, Shamrock vs. Mankind for the IC title, 
Outlaws vs. Headbangers for the tag titles, X-Pac vs. Jarrett Guitar on a pole match, Undertaker vs. Helmsley, Foul Venus vs. Goldust and Gangrel and Edge vs. Mark Henry and D. Lo Brown. WWF has reached an agreement to have their products sold worldwide at amusement parks, fairs and carnivals. Vinnie Jones, a household name soccer star in England, will be appearing as Austin second on the December 6th UK Capital Carnage pay-per-view. The signing for the show was carried as a major tabloid news item this past week in the UK. Jones also starred in a popular movie Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels in the UK that came out this year. Both the Montreal Gazette and National Post ran a story on Jeff Jarrett on November 10th, and the guitar on a pole matches. According to the story, the guitars they use as gimmicks are unstrung guitars with minor structural changes not to lessen the concussive force, but to make louder kabooms and messier destructions. A few notes about the Raw show which aired on November 23rd taped November 17th in Columbus, Ohio before a sellout 12678 paying $261,716. The big story on the show was the Austin Angle, which was unusually lame to the point I'm shocked it got through the editing process except the WWF believes, and they're right for the most part, that the name of their success is shock value. And when you play that game, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. It left a bad taste on an otherwise good show. Gangrel and Edge vs. Henry and Brown was a good match, showing the improvement made in a lot of the wrestlers. The three-way match with Mankind, Shamrock and Bossman was also good, as was Outlaws vs. Job Squad, in particular Egan Scorpio, who has been a good performer in the past but hasn't shown much of anything in more than one year, and not only because he's been put in positions a lot where he can't, appear to be motivated and look the best he's looked since the first month or two in the WWF before they started the burial process. Rock vs. X-Pac was the best match on the show, so you're talking four good matches on one show and it's been a long since on either show since that has happened. Other house shows this past week saw November 18th in Cincinnati drew 8,182 paying $172,790, November 19th in San Diego drew 8,804 paying $164,219, November 20th at the new arena that just opened in Bakersfield, California drew a sellout 9,920 paying $230,925, November 21st at the Pond in Anaheim drew 13,426 paying $319,454, and November 22nd in San Jose drew 10,655 paying $270,085. Merchandise for the week was $400,071 or $6.28 per head. Austin and Undertaker had Cincinnati and San Diego off so they went with Rock beating Kane with Bossman playing Hill Ref and Shamrock over Mankind as the top matches on those shows. The San Jose show on November 22nd was a very good house show, particularly since it was the final show of an eight-day tour which included three tapings and cross-country flight. Almost everyone worked hard, particularly the younger wrestlers, and the crowd was into most of it and nothing looked bad. It didn't have crazy moves and stunts like at an ECW house show, but the work rate was surprisingly strong for a house show and a lot better than at most TV tapings. After seeing everyone live, my estimation a few weeks back about 35% of the guys on physique enhancing drugs seems to be awfully kind and 45% is probably closer to reality. Show saw Golga and Kurgan over too much in 523 when Golga pinned Scott Taylor with the earthquake splash. Luna looks so totally different in person without the extensions. All comedy spots because of the ridiculous size difference. Too much has a lot of talent. Kurgan is totally lost and Golga is boring and they mainly did no-sell spots and midget match comedy because of the size difference. Size is all illusion in wrestling and Christopher and Taylor look to be 4 feet tall because Tenta is 6 foot 6 and Kurgan is 6 foot 11. Edge and Gangrel beat DOA in 637 when Paul Ellering hit Ron Harris with a lame briefcase shot and Gangrel pinned him. DOA are so deceptively huge that they made Edge seem like a skinny midget. Fans were chanting Hanson at Edge and Christian which isn't Stan the Lariat. Not much heat. DOA played heel. X-Pac beat Al Snow to keep the European title in 401. It was really hot while it lasted. Snow played heel and X-Pac looked real good, and used La Magistral for the pin. Snow gave the head a pile driver and an elbow drop after the match blaming it for the loss. Sable and Christian beat Marrow and Jacqueline in 808 when Sable pinned Jacqueline after a power bomb. The guys worked almost the entire match, setting the women up for the finish. Not good, but it accomplished what it was supposed to. Austin won a non-title four-way with Bossman as ref over Rock, Kane and Undertaker in 1044. This was the show stealer and a legit three-and-a-half-star match.
Rock and Austin work surprisingly hard, Austin in particular considering the amount of money he's making and could easily get by on a lot less. Taker and Kane were out of the spotlight most of the way but did enough to where you didn't feel they were being carried that much. You can tell they've done these matches so much they've got everything down. You know the story. Stunner on Rock but Boss Man won't count the pin. Stunner on Boss Man. Taker choke slammed Austin but no ref. Earl Hackner runs in. Rock misses the people's elbow on Austin and gets hit with a stunner for the pin. After the match Heckner put the boots to Bossman and he and Austin celebrated together except for the brief spot where Austin was selling the angle as if he was having a dizzy spell. I don't think anyone in the building even noticed Austin stumble as there was no reaction or buzz in the crowd about it. Steve Blackman beat Blue Blazer, who was Owen Hart this time, in 357 with a Japanese rolling crotch hold. No heat at all. They actually worked fine and were working a good fast-paced match in there a lot of time but the crowd has decided to hate the match before it ever started. Venus beat Goldust in 4.33. Venus got a big pop coming out. They got no reaction once the match started but worked hard for their allotted time as well. Ref Tim White stopped Goldust from doing Shattered Dreams and Venus schoolboyed him. Goldust gave Venus Shattered Dreams after the match and kissed White. Fans weren't into Goldust as a face. Shamrock beat Mankind in 7.22 of a Falls Count Anywhere IC title match after a power slam. Fairly good with a lot of heat. Mankind put the Sako Claw on after. Show finished with Outlaws beating Henry and Brown in a tag title match in 1020. The ring intro spot was over huge which was no surprise. But the match itself had very good heat and everyone worked hard. Well, at least Road Dog and Brown did and they were in most of the time. Henry doesn't do much but bear hug. Dog pinned Henry after Billy Gunn hit him with the title belt. You haven't lived until you have a nine-year-old kid come up to you and say that the New Age Outlaws can't work a lickin' or nothing but a cool ring entrance and that really Ken Shamrock could beat any of these guys if it were real. That's a far cry from a decade ago when kids would blindly chant USA, USA during a Davy Boy Smith vs. Iron Sheik match and when you ask them why, they'd respond, because they were cheering for the American. Don't forget to buy your sweetie the brand new WWF cologne for Christmas. I don't think there's anything any guy would want to smell like more than a WWF wrestler at the end of their match. Maybe in the 80s when much of the crew never even broke a sweat in the ring but not these guys. They're also coming out with WWF beanie babies for kids. Postscript on the huge in-building advance for the Toronto Raw taping in February that Jim Ross keeps bringing up on the air as they are going to have a huge crowd for that show. The lines were so ridiculously long to buy tickets for the next show that there were fans in line who literally missed almost the entire show waiting to buy tickets for the Raw. That put them in a good mood as there were a few fights in the lines that were moving real slow. WWF will be putting out a Best of Jesse Ventura video on December 15th. WWF Weekend Rating saw Live Wire at 2.0 Superstars at 1.9 and Heat with a 4.07 rating and a 6.24 share, all ratings well above usual. The Reader's Pages Observer In my 12 years of reading The Observer, the October 5th issue was the first that made me shake my head in disbelief over something you wrote. In criticizing Larry Zbyszko for downplaying the style of the luchadores, you claim that maybe those wrestlers should be praised for risking their bodies to get ahead in the sport. So should be praised guys like Jim Helwig and Terry Balia, who risk their bodies to get ahead by using anabolic steroids? What's the difference? The difference is that the luchadores give us better matches so it's okay for them to risk their bodies and it's not okay for steroid users too, and you really come off as totally selfish. The same you who during the early 90s steroid scandal called Vince McMahon selfish for encouraging his employees to use steroids and risk their health for his own pocketbook. Yet you've never called McMahon selfish for allowing Mick Foley to almost fall to his death in the hell in the cell cage match. You've never called Paul Heyman selfish for encouraging his employees to dive off balconies and do more damage to themselves than steroids ever could. If you honestly believe that Foley's bones and his body are in better shape than Hellwig's or Balia's, you're kidding yourself and your readers. The fact is, people were predicting that the heavy steroid users of the 80s would be like Billy Graham today. Not only has that not happened, or shown any signs of happening soon, but I'd guess the next Billy Grahams aren't going to be the roid freaks of the 80s but the Mick Foley's, Terry Brunks and Rey Mysterio Jr.'s of today. A lot of guys don't have the size or charisma to make it in pro wrestling. Some take steroids and some do Aussie moonsaults. Why do we praise one and criticize the other? Because one style makes things more entertaining for us? Pretty selfish considering both are doing the same harm. When he downplays those moves, maybe Zabishko is just showing concern for those wrestlers' bodies, something all of us should do. 
because the odds are most won't have careers as long as Larry's. We should be praising guys like Owen Hart, Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit who have toned down their styles and have become better wrestlers because of it, while also lengthening their careers. Yeah, maybe some of the luchadores couldn't make it if they toned down their style. But a lot of wrestlers wouldn't have made it without taking steroids. Both are dangerous. I can't see the logic behind defending one style and condemning the other, unless it's from a purely selfish standpoint. And how is Dynamite Kid doing these days? Oh yeah, he retired due to injuries and he's not even 40 yet. But he sure gave us some great matches and high-risk moves to enjoy. The question is, can we go back and watch those matches without feeling guilty? Jeff Gogliardo. San Jose, California. Response from Dave Meltzer. Great letter. There is a certain reality about contact sports, and many other sports as well. Joint pain and injuries are inevitable byproducts. Maiming shouldn't be, although it sometimes happens. Nor should early death and cancer risks. Pro wrestling is a stuntman business and a contact sport. Pro wrestling is more dangerous now than ever because there is more money, more competition for the top spots and a more acrobatic style brought upon by an audience with a shorter attention span and higher demands for immediate action. Most good wrestlers, even though this new style will tend to shorten careers, will still last far longer than most good football and even basketball players. Almost all last longer at their peak than real fighters, whether they be in Valley Tudo, boxing or whatever, and even gymnasts. My previous girlfriend was a coach of teenage and preteen gymnastics and my niece competes in it and those young girls were doing tremendous damage to their knees and ankles and the percentage of them out of action at any given time is higher than you'd imagine. Most elite competitors have knee and back problems by the age of 20 and many had tendonitis in their knees before the age of 10. With the exception of being happy for Mick Foley that in his own weird way he got to live out his dream, I was 100% sad watching the Hell in the Cell match because he could have gotten maimed permanently and the risk he took was in many ways greater than the risk a lot of heavy steroid users take. The ECW balcony dives I'm not a fan of, but the person doing the dives is under control. They are risky. The worst that has happened from one of them thus far is a guy getting up limping for a few days, as far as ribs and ankles and knees but it isn't going head over heels where you could break a neck or die, which is when the stunt show becomes totally sick. I worry more about the long-term effect of unprotected brain jarring hard chair shots to the head which have become something of an in thing in today's pro wrestling and guys that have suffered too many knockout losses in boxing, kickboxing or any full contact combat sport. Most type of injuries suffered in pro wrestling are considered both as acceptable and inevitable parts of many other sports, with the exception of the brain damage in boxing, and the health risks of the steroids, and maybe those being exceptions are a naive view of sports as well. If you've ever been close to death, you don't worry much about bad knees or a bad shoulder but you do worry about surviving and diminished brain capacity. Destroying your brain from repeated concussions and trauma shouldn't be both an acceptable and inevitable part of sports, although it is in sports where concussions are plentiful. Whether it's football, gymnastics or even powerlifting, it is inevitable you are going to get hurt and your body is going to eventually give out on you, some faster than others. Dynamite Kid who had to retire in his early 30s because of injuries, and his body gave out both because of a lot of crazy bumps, one very serious back injury that would have ended most people's career in sports and he came back from it, probably too soon, and because his body had stiffened up and become brittle because of the imbalances created by being bloated for its natural structure by all the steroids. He ended up with an 18-year career, most of it as one of the top performers in his sport. How many NFL players or gymnasts and boxers last anywhere near that long? Just about none. Yet he's the best example people come up with about insane bumps ending careers. How many are still on top past 40 and still making money in wrestling comparing with those sports? Ultimo Dragon due to a botched up surgery necessitated by all the punishment from years of high flying may be done at 31. Muay Thai fighters are almost all finished by the age of 23 because of punishment without a botched up surgery threatening to end their career. That is just what contact sports are. Fans of those sports are no less caring or selfish than pro wrestling fans. All fans of contact sports get off on the brutality and only give minor worries to the consequences of them because there is an assembly line churning out the next generation of stars in every sport and the reality is a top athlete only has a limited time in the spotlight. Wrestling fans have been spoiled that due to the worked nature, a top wrestler can have more time than almost any contact sport athlete. Who were the innovators of the real high-flying wrestling in the 70s? Pero Aguayo Sr., Lismark Sr., Dos Caras, Gran Hamada, Viano Tercero and Mil Mascaras. All of them despite the style they wrestled were still top workers and headliners when they were 40 years old. And there were others with the same style, 
just as guys who did stall style, who got a bad injury and had to quit. But all the Mexican luchadores of the 70s all long outlived Larry Zabisco and virtually every American wrestler from that era. Every name mentioned is considerably older than Zabisco is today and all still wrestling on top and Hamada is still damn good and the rest are still all headliners. While this sounds stupid and makes no sense, the reality is in every one of those names mentioned, the risk-taking long extended their careers in the ring because they never would have been stars to the degree they were without them and some never would have been in the ring in the first place without them. And in all cases, they are going to be hurting real bad when they get older because of it, just as NFL linemen who last 10 or 15 years in the pits are going to be. All athletes in endeavors like this, whether they make money at it or not, are going to pay some price. Some more than others and the more reckless ones generally a heavier price. There is a line and I don't know where it is, between doing entertaining stuff to get over and find a niche in a very competitive entertainment sport, and the sickness where someone goes too far. For every Rey Mysterio Jr. who has to sit out most of a year at 23 and may never be as good as he once was, or he may be like Jushin Liger who tweaks his style and becomes a different but still excellent performer, how many football players at the same age are hurt far worse, and will never make a comeback from it and how many people the size of Rey Mysterio Jr. are going to make it in the NFL to begin with? It's an inherent part of contact sports and a problem of being undersized to any sport where size matters so much. Steroids are a totally different animal even with the similarities you mentioned. With the possible exception of Plum Marico, and that isn't even definite since it's been claimed it was from a neurological condition although my feeling is it probably was related to head trauma from bumps, no wrestler in the last 18 years has died from punishment in the ring. Painful knees are a completely different animal than kidney or liver problems just as a hip replacement may occur with more frequency with big bump takers than steroid users, although it can happen to either, and it is bad news. But you can compare it with cancer or brain damage. Many have died or had their lives shortened by steroids. Indirectly, there are guys who did a lot of crazy moves who developed alcohol and drug problems due to the pain from those moves and did die prematurely from them, but it was still the inability to keep the drinking and drugs under control that did it and not the bumps themselves. Mick Foley's hip probably isn't going to last as long as the majority of the roid freaks of the 80s and he is going to pay for his fame in his old age but he also most likely will have an old age. His risk of cancer and heart disease is a lot less and I doubt that Monday morning when Flo Joe died that he broke out in a cold sweat like so many of his contemporaries and predecessors did. You have to accept injuries as a consequence and forced retirements of athletes in their 30s and wrestling. There is a line between acceptable and unacceptable risks and to me it's when you do something where injury is an expected inevitable of the move rather than a risk if you or your opponent blow the spot or a freak deal if the joint just picks that moment to give out. That's just like in almost every other sport because to not accept it is being blind to reality. But I can't accept too many deaths in their 30s and 40s, whether they be John Studd, who never did a high-risk moves in his life and whose own doctor went on television said his death was from steroids, or the heavy steroid users that we hear about regularly dying in their 30s and 40s not just in this sport but in every sport associated with heavy steroid use from heart attacks and cancer. Rutan. Every time people are looking to screw with pancreas. First the fights are works and everybody knows it. Then the fights are works and only one of the fighters knows it. This time I heard they were saying when I fought Masakatsu Funaki that Funaki decided to throw the fight because he thought it was a good time for that. When I fought for the King of Pancrase title, I was already one year undefeated. When I fought Funaki, I was one year and nine months undefeated. This was the best record ever already in Pancrase. Anyone who would beat me would be the man. Before my fight with Funaki, Funaki was also beaten by Frank Shamrock. There was no better time for Funaki to beat me because I was the one who had beaten Frank Shamrock. The second thing. When did Funaki decide to throw the fight? Before or after he tried to break my knee with that he'll hold in his neck. For people who want to see this, look at the 330 mark of the fight. This also counts for the people who say this bullshit and never looked at the tape and only repeat what other people say. After the fight many fighters came to me and asked how it was possible that I didn't tap on the heel hold because Funaki put a lot of pressure on it. He reversed by foot. Or did Funaki decide to throw the fight after I hit him down for the first time? Just before I hit him I'm on my knees and Funaki wants to kick me in the face. Was that a real kick or did he know that I was going to block it? Or did Funaki decide to throw the fight after I slammed his head back on the canvas and he broke his nose? I don't get it. When did he decide to throw the fight? Please look at the tape before you start making stupid comments like this. Don't just repeat what other people say. In Holland we call these kind of people sheep, because sheep always do what other sheep do for no reason. 
if I tell people that all the fights I lost in Pancrase were works, everyone will repeat this and soon people will believe it. If Funaki was acting, he played a dangerous game with me giving me a heel hook like that. Maybe he knows exactly how my body reacts. I don't know. For me all the fights I did were real. I will never put myself down like that and throw a fight because then I'd think of myself as a wimp and I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. Only when everybody knows, like in the WWF, would I do something like that. I also heard that people are saying K1 is fake. They say it's because it isn't possible for there to be so many KOs in K1. This was a blessing for me because now I know that people really don't know what they are talking about. By the way Holyfield threw the fight against Mike Tyson when Tyson bit his ear off, only Tyson didn't know this. Get it? Voss Rutten. Beverly Hills, California. Rings. I've been a Rings fan since 1991. I'd rather watch it than any other promotion and Folk Han has been my favorite wrestler of the decade. But their new changes are terrible. There is no reason to do shoots when you've got state-of-the-art workers like Han, Kiyoshi Tamura, Tsuyoshi Kosaka, Ilya Kain Mikhail, and Hiromitsu Kaneara. I quit watching Pancrase well over a year ago because I resented 10-minute time limit matches that ended in decisions. A couple of shoot matches early in the card are great, but if you do more, they become boring because they all start looking the same. A good rings worked match is a thing of beauty. They accomplish their goals without using illogical flying moves, BS American angles and screw job finishes. It's pure wrestling and I love it. Shoots eliminate the brilliant holds and counters and all you have left is a bunch of guys laying around in the guard. The scoring and rule changes are also crazy. They are just going to result in fans being cheated and open the door to more cop-out finishes. They've already made a royal mess out of the Battle Dimension tournament, which used to be the highlight of the year. In 1997, I thought Rings was the only major company in wrestling that improved its product instead of deteriorated. Now they're joining the club. I don't think Tamura's loss to Valentija Overeem hurt them as badly as you do. It was a competitive shoot match with a great young athlete and he got caught. It was Tamura losing the title to Bitsanjay Terriel in a squash match that killed him. Akira made his matches in 1998 have been adequate. It looks terrible but they've kept his matches on the mat and he works on the mat well and hasn't appeared to blow up even in his longer matches. He looks like a strong candidate for most improved wrestler for 1998. Everything WCW touches turns to mush. Eric Bischoff and whoever helps him kills every program he tries to promote. They would have sold more pay-per-view orders by just having one warrior interview and putting them both in the ring. I've heard Bischoff is tired of having his ass kicked by Vince McMahon every week and has hired Jimmy Snuka to write Warriors interviews. I've been taking Composine to settle my stomach and overcome the effects of seeing Scott Steiner's handicap matches against two ex-Lucha Libre world champions, Silver King and Norman Smiley. The racist lawsuit against WCW should be a class action case. We're all suffering. Steve Yohei. Montebello, California. NBC Special. I thought the NBC Special was so-so. NBC was smart to do this now while the ratings are hot. But eerie time I heard that narrator say, but wait, here's the secret. I wanted to jump through the TV and DDT the guy off Warren Littlefield's head. This is the time for ESPN to capitalize on wrestling but doing a sports center type show revolving around wrestling, but doing the show in a totally legit manner. Enough people are smart enough now to understand the inside news. Vince Carolyn. Stoughton, Massachusetts. Life can be so strange sometimes. Who could know that within three days, I'd see both the worst and best wrestling documentaries ever made. The only good thing about the NBC special was that it gave interview fodder to Mick Foley and Chris Jericho. It was condescending, trite, and a sad example of what passes for an investigative documentary. Harley Race must really be hurting to have done that gig. Luckily, two days later, I was vindicated when I saw Hitman Hart, wrestling with shadows. Boy were they lucky. Imagine filming a documentary on Bret Hart for one year and ending with that story. Observer readers will be astonished as the events of that year, as so accurately documented for us beforehand in The Observer, unfold before your eyes. Hearing Shawn Michaels deny to Hart that he wasn't part of the screw job instantly shows his fear of wanting to get out of there as fast as possible. And while the film stayed away from the overdone real versus fake issue, it is during Hart's discussion of that very issue that makes the film. Therefore this is definitely the movie that non-wrestling fans need to see. Die-hard wrestling fans are going to watch it anyway. They won't learn that much, except that maybe Vader is a big baby but for all others, it's a real eye-opener. Dan Love Vronsky. Toronto, Ontario. Raw. Raw is adult TV? 
Great adult TV? That makes Chris Cruz angry because isn't pro wrestling supposed to be for kids? You know the way it was when he fell in love with it 30 years ago? Ah, yes, I miss those days too. For me it began in 1972, back when wrestling was for kids. While most kids turned to ABC after school specials for morality plays and lessons on settling arguments with friends, I learned to settle disputes through pro wrestling. Victor Rivera, one of the many traditional babyface icons in my mouth, proved that petty bickering and insults never do anyone any good. No, it's much more efficient to challenge Big Bad John to a gladiator chain match, pummel him into a bloody semi-conscious pulp, wrap the long chain around his bloody head and throat like a boa constrictor and drag him around the ring by his neck until the whites of his eye bulged and his tongue puffed out of his mouth. I carry that message with me every day, and only hope that I possess the wisdom to pass it on to future generations of children. It was an enchanted ear where it was okay to laugh at midgets and dwarves because they all run aimlessly in circles, steal referees to pace and bite each other on the butt. Was it really necessary to degrade them by renaming them minis and forcing them to do sophisticated high spots? Jim Ross is also way too believable. His delivery last Monday suspended my disbelief and I found myself wailing, Hawk, get down from there. Don't jump. Yes, Vince, please mark it raw for children again. When I have children, I loathe the very idea of ever having to supervise their TV viewing. So Vince, could you do it for me? And please change that raw format ASAP. I want to make damn sure that my little nephews and nieces start their Monday night TV viewing at 9 p.m and go to bed all hyper and revved up at 11 p.m. Kurt Brown. Brea, California. This is the end of this issue. See you next time.